listening to the sweet sounds of the After Movie Diner. Support us at P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash After Movie Diner. Or I'll punch you in the teats. Rate and review us on iTunes, Earthling. And now, here's your host, John Cross. Hello, and welcome to this, the first After Movie Diner episode of 2021. Uh, Here we are, living in the future, and everything is very much the same as it has been. Uh, Temporarily, we hope. Because what did people expect? Not not temporarily. It's going to be forever uh, that, that things are awful. Uh, just embrace it. Embrace, embrace the awfulness, and just accept it. Uh, that's what I've chosen to do, and that's why uh, I will survive. Uh, is that, is, <laughs> that's that, what, is that what acceptance sounds like? <laughs> like being really pessimistic about everything? Well, not being really pessimistic. I'm just saying, like the the every, everyone is you know everyone loves a deadline right everyone's sort of like oh you know new year 2021 it's going to be so much better than 2020 say goodbye to the old end with the new right or they're like oh when biden takes office everything's going to change because like no more trump and we're going to have biden and da 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 out with the old in with the new everyone gets super excited and i'm like have we clearly have learned nothing <laughs> from uh the fact that uh you know we've been having new years uh, for for decades, as far as I'm aware, um, and uh, everything is still awful. Um, people are still gre- greedy. Politicians are still uh, self serving uh, assholes. So, I, you know, uh, th- there's still a pandemic running around. In fact, the pandemic is worse now than it was when we all locked down to begin with. Um, uh, you know, twenty percent uh, infection rate in California as we speak, rising. Um, so, you know, I, th- we we also haven't bought enough of the vaccine. Um, and uh, Biden is saying that at the rate that we're giving it out is going to be twenty million by the end of the year. It's going to barely be two million by the end of the year, and that's only the first round of the vaccine. Um, he said at this rate, it's well, going to go would, on for I years. Just like so I'm just, say, I'm just like saying. To, I just like to say yes. I'm very grateful to have been invited on yeah. um, Newsnight, and <laughs> I don't know why you've asked me because no, no. normally I talk rubbish yeah. um, about <laughs> movies. I speculate wildly yes. about people I don't know yes. and their motives that I couldn't possibly fathom yes. in making said terrible movies. Yes. But uh, now I'm on. Yes. Now I'm on. Um, <laughs> I will say that I I feel that um, the evolution of modern politics. Um, dictates some sort of uh, change uh, in the status quo. Yes. Um, even if all that is, is that I'm pretty sure that one of them is dead, right? What's that? Uh, is status quo. I, I think it's the guitarist. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think he's dead. So you, I feel... You went from sarcasm to surrealism. World yes. will be different. Yes. from now on okay it, you know it won't no. be as full so I, I take your point That's my feeling about about the future i take and, your point and, and your weird and your weird 80s dad rock uh segue which i did appreciate massively uh that was that was a sheer pleasure my, my only point really was that you said i was being pessimistic and i was simply pointing out that i feel like i'm being realistic because i don't feel negative i don't feel negative i, I don't feel overly positive but i don't feel negative i just feel like let us at least accept the scenarios and surroundings in which we find ourselves instead of doing what we've done for the last eight to nine months which is hope uh, on magic pixies uh magic pixies who are not going to show up so i'm just i'm just saying that i would just rather you like it you like it you like it you like it <laughs> here we go Rocking all over the world.
Yes. So anyway, uh, hilarious jokes notwithstanding, <laughs> I think you know where I'm coming from. Anyway, uh, it's, mate. it's, mate. it's too mate. exciting. It's the second. Uh, it's the first episode of 2021. It's the second episode of our uh, outrageously yeah, bad. You're, you're like uh, what your strategy, your podcast strategy is all over the place. You got the first episode of 2021 is the second episode of a season. It's the third season of the year right because we did sleazy spade of springtime and pleasance and now uh, idle yeah right are those the only seasons you've done this year no we did a detec- like an unofficial we, detective season. we did an unofficial detective season but but the, by the by as people can tell uh i spoke the truth when i said things won't change very much because again you've interrupted my <laughs> introduction which <laughs> is something that you are now i mean we should just I'm patent a legend, it. we should mate. just I don't patent let it down i don't want to let down the fans yeah the fans expect a certain structure do you know yeah. what i mean don't don't what let they want, is, they want they want uh, a a, um, <laughs> a well argued and yes. concise uh, political uh, opening that I <laughs> derail with status quo jokes like no, no. that. Uh, that's we, what they've come to expect every we, week since we, had, we started. We right? had moved past my uh, uh, ramblings about that. It, we had moved into the actual introduction. Uh, of the the movie based oh, did that happen? podcast, yes, did I and, just that? and you interrupted that uh, oh, because you felt that the the world needed more of you uh, being <laughs> no, I'm just pointing out that sarcastic. I, I think, I think and, it's. Uh, and uh, I, I just feel knocking that me for pointing out the reality in which we all live. Uh, not in an effort to be pessimistic, but in an effort to just say to people, "Hey, embrace it," because when you embrace uh, the embrace now, the and like, li- no, like no, wait, no, 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 hang on a second. Really every, you every, are, uh, you are cut. Every psychologist worth its salt, well, worth their salt, really will hair. will tell you um, yeah. that uh, living in the moment is imperative. And all I'm saying is, is live within the moment that you find yourself. And yeah, we if, find ourselves... Hang on a second, I'm before... Sure that that's the message before, to give people who are listening to this podcast. Hang on a second. Because if they want to live in the moment, they, you know, they just turn us off. I think this hilarious... I think this hilarious uh, uh, back and forth on this subject has gone on long enough, and I've really okay. been trying well, you're, you're, to... You're putting your foot down. I, well, I've been trying to introduce... Well, 2021, the, do you want to get yourself, like, some kind of a gavel, right? Or, like, a <laughs> squeaky gavel that you can bang. I mean, you bang the squeaky gavel, it's like... I've had enough. Yeah. The interruptions are over. I'd like to get back on track. <laughs> well, I would, yes. I'm just going to play on with the introduction. Hello, everybody. Okay. It's the After Movie Diner. As always, our <laughs> co host, Jim, is fantastic and we love his silly, silly, ugly bum face. And uh, we are going to uh, be moving on to our second episode of our outrageously bad Eric Idol film season. Uh, Q- is that what it's officially called? That's what I it's officially called. It- on Facebook. So it's the outrageously bad Eric Idol film season. Yes, and that's what the theme tune is if you had listened to the last episode. I have of, not. Okay. I have not. If you, no. There's a whole theme tune. There's a whole theme oh, tune. Okay, great. All right, well, I'll listen to it now. And I it's mean, coming out right now. It, it, normally, I don't. I used to listen, but now I don't because I've realized that I've, I have literally heard it all before. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, look, uh, you know, at a, at a certain point, one starts to just uh, uh, b- preach to the crowd, and we have a crowd. It's small, but loyal. Uh, and I, it's I sort of a crowd of sheds, which, when you put them together, <laughs> yeah. looks much bigger than it is, because only one person per shed. One person per shed, but some sheds can be quite... Uh, quite yeah, square footage-wise, square we're doing footage. great. Yes. Actual ears, yes. less... Less less ears, more footage. More footage, uh, but, yeah. <laughs> That should be the slogan of the podcast. That's it. That's it. <laughs> but saying but saying that, second episode of the outrageously bad Eric Arda film season. Uh, here is the theme song. Well, it's the outrageously bad Eric Arda film season. Yeah, it's the outrageously bad Eric Arda film season. And in typical idol fashion, I thought I'd start it with a song. Nobody asked me to, but I need to make more references to penises and dongs. And some thinly veiled innuendos about tits that some might think passes for wit and ingratiates me with the LA set who are quick to embrace me and quick to forget that I've made some truly outrageously bad films for some reason. Well, he's the after movie diner back to remind you. 
outrageously bad Eric Idle film season. It's the outrageously bad Eric Idle film season. Outrageously bad. Oh yeah, you gotta always look on the bright side of life, except during the outrageously bad Eric Idle film season. And this song has gone on far too long without mentioning my dong. Oh, something like that anyway. Boobs. And yes, wonderful. And we are going to be uh, talking all about something that happened on Twitter this very evening. Oh, yes, I'm dying to hear uh, it. Regarding, it regarding Eric Idle. Can I just uh, say, can yes. I just say, I would like to, I would just, on the record, I would like to admire your balls. Yes. Because <laughs> to, to chase down Idle for an interview <laughs> on what you are plastering all over social media as yes. the outrageously bad Eric Idle film season yes. is it takes chutzpah, I believe, is the expression. Well, outside of the movie that we're covering tonight, which obviously he wrote, produced, and starred in, and therefore has a uh, invested interest in, and therefore probably much closer to his heart. Outside of that, every other movie we are covering, he has gone on record as saying was a bad movie. Right? And he has said in interviews um, that, you know, the films he's been in and the sitcoms he's done and so on and so forth were not very good. Um, so he said that himself. Also, the the joke is on me because I was the one that post- Python fandom went and tracked down all these films. So, uh, and, so saying and Eric Idle owes you one. No, I'm I'm just saying that within the realm of the British cheeky chappy sense of humour, he should understand that the Eric Idle outrageously bad film season is is meant both with cheeky, you know, tongue in cheek, and, and with love, but at the same time. A, an acknowledgement that these films are, you know, outrageously bad. Is it, I feel is it like meant it with works. love, or is it meant with with contempt? <laughs> well, uh, it's no, it's uh, it's no. There's there's love there. for the movies, not for him. For the movies, oh, the movies, for are, his choices. The movie, the movies are contemptible, but the, for his for his for, him, for his treatment of Neil Innes, for him and for his treatment of Neil Innes, yeah, uh, outrageously bad, but. And we'll get. In fact, this is a good point to 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 at this point to pull out the message that John, your brother John Wallace, left us uh, on the last idol because I think it speaks to kind of the the duality of idols that we yeah, are right, we enough, are dealing yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so his message uh, on the last Burn Hollywood Burn episode um, from uh, earlier in December, he said, "I do love the way you turn on Idol during the podcast. Yeah. At first, painting him sympathetically as a lonely expat drifter." and then branding him a randy plagiarizing python whore however (laughs) idol might react to this season and i think and i think he would be very very surprised to learn of its existence i hope and i pray that idol 3000 a dystopian christmas carol is made in the very near future i'm eating up this series both infinitely more entertaining than the films themselves i remember splitting airs making me actually physically nauseous when watching it (laughs) Uh, but john talks of a good point the duality of idol there is a part of me that will forever love eric idol for his uh uh python work uh for the rutland for for rutland we get television and also when you watch him like if you watch youtube interviews like i watch youtube and, and i watch a lot of youtube interviews um the, the pythons kind of break like john cleese like tries to be caustic and 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 uh shocking and and just generally like a miserable old curmudgeon and you know G- gilliam's an absolute mad ball of hair who should probably not do any interviews palin sadly is just boring like when you see palin interviewed you're like <laughs> like getting a balloon palin <laughs> Yeah. Go on, go off to Azerbaijan. Spend one of a volcano pale in the <laughs> linen shirt, and then maybe we'll listen to what you have to say. But no, I mean, I love Palin. I do love Palin deep down, but he's very boring in interviews. Idol is the only one that when I watch him in interviews, I'm like, I'd I'd probably quite like, you know, hanging out with Idol. So I have is- to, yeah, I, I have to say, to be fair, speaking to the duality of Idol, I feel like... In his, in I mean, we'll 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 get to it with this movie, but I feel yes. like in his favour is clearly 
burn Hollywood Burns awfulness has got nothing to do with him. Nothing to do with him, no. And and although Splitting Airs is not by any measure a good movie, it is at least made with the intention to try and make you laugh. It's it's good natured. It's not good, no, but it is good natured. And if yes. it's his, if that's his idea of a movie, then I don't think he can be all bad. No, he's not bad. And I, I, I do not want anyone to think that, either jokingly or otherwise, that I would ever suggest that Eric Idle is a bad person. No. No, I don't think so either. Except, presumably, of how he treated Neil Lewis. Right. And I think, I think that was played out both publicly and privately between him and Neil. And as 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 this is the day, and this is kind of sad, but we are recording this on the anniversary of Neil Innes's passing, so I don't know if that's fitting or not. <laughs> uh, I think it he feels would like it's a line we should just. Not, it's not about crossing or anything. It's just like let's just pretend the line's not there. Yeah. You know what I mean? No, I mean I listen. Let's not even talk about the line. If if we if we're in some sort of weird let's say neil and survived and we're in some weird post-apocalyptic future where they're lining up you know uh, over the hill surreal comedians from the 1960s and we have to pick between them uh, i would probably pick neil over eric but it would be it would be uh, uh with a heavy heart it would be with a heavy heart and and i only mean that because i feel See, like what you're saying is if eric is listening yeah. he should know that in the future <laughs> where all washed up comedians are put up against a wall yeah. you would shoot him <laughs> yeah but you would do so with a sense of regret well i would do so to and save the could be said i would do eric so to, no, no. i would kill you but i wouldn't feel great about it I would do it to save Neil Innes. That's all I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, okay, fine, fine, got it. But but beyond that, beyond that, um, I I would I would have to say I, th- th- it is definitely with love. I could not enter this series if I did not have love. That's and- true, and he's not he's not cyn- I, I didn't think like again splitting airs for all of its faults. It's not cynical. No, it's not mean. It's not cruel. It's, it's not. It's just not original in any way. No, it's but, just, it, no, but it's yeah, but but I'm saying the. What could be funny. said about it is, it's sort of it's it's clueless. Yeah. And I, because I like to speculate, my speculation is it's clueless out of insecurity rather than a lack of talent. It yes. seems. To me. And and again, because uh, uh, because we we were going back to it to to the story about uh, uh, Eric Idle and, and Twitter, but before oh, we, I'm sorry, before yeah, we get, that was quite more interesting than anything I have to say ever. No, no, it's not that. I just don't want to go into a dissection of the movie or your wild hypothesis until we've got past <laughs> the, the the stuff that we've got to get past. So I'm, right, I'm trying right, to... Right, 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 but right. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm with you. Bang the gavel. Bang and the squeaky gavel. I, I love it. <laughs> I will have to get like a comically oversized a squeaky, squeaky hammer. Yeah. I, can't be, I can't be contained. <laughs> Jim! Jim's a wild man. I can't be contained or... If, um, if so, oh, oh! If someone is listening, if someone is yeah. listening who has not yet rated and reviewed the podcast on whatever podcast platform they listen to, please go on that podcast platform and rate and review with um, John's fine, but his co-host Jim is a wild man who cannot be contained. <laughs> I want that review uh, to to live in infamy on on our podcast. Please do, please. Go on to iTunes. I'm, I'm, I'm honestly telling whoever's listening who has not yet rated and reviewed the podcast on iTunes, where we have some wonderful reviews. We also have one that was like, "Get to the point," and we're like, "No, <laughs> the point of the show is we don't get to the point." But well, the point uh, is, there is no point. <laughs> just like life, mate. Oh, so deep, oh, so, so deep. achingly deep. Um, oh, but please, someone write a review that starts with "John's okay, but Jim, his co-host, is a wild man who cannot be contained." It's anyway. True. It is true. Anyway, uh, I would love that. Uh, so, uh, Eric Idle, it's N- Neil and his passing. Uh, there's a connection there. We're not going to go on about it too much. So, today, uh, I was doing my usual thing. So, J- John also sent me some messages uh, on, on Facebook, and I think this will get into it. Uh, he was saying, loving the Eric Idle series. It was making me chuckle while shopping at the height of the COVID panic. There is something deeply satisfying about the thought of you ploughing through idle interviews to try and understand Splitting Airs. 
<laughs> this is what you should be paid to do. There should be a cross foundation devoted to supporting your deep dives into obscure movie mediocrity. If I'd have been Moranis when I had seen the poster, and in the poster, Idol is cradling a baby Moranis. Oh, I remember that. Wearing yeah. a large crown. He said, I, he said, if I had been Moranis and seen that poster, I would be absolutely fucking furious with Idol. <laughs> Not just for the baby Moranis, but the fact Idol is pulling that Hello Sailor face and <clears> instantly <throat> rendering the whole project a carry on veneer. Uh, anyway, um, the reason why I mention that comment is because I do indeed and have been enjoying doing deep dives into uh, idle interviews, idle reviews, uh, um, uh, all sorts of things that I can find about the various movies. And Burn Hollywood, Burn, I, I found a bunch of stuff. And, it's and very interesting, mate. But you, you provide the colour and the, and the facts um, to the podcast, which nicely complement my irrelevant um, <laughs> postulating yes. and pointless wittering. Your wild hi- hypothesis. But I yeah. feel like if I bring... If it you, it'd be like, well, uh, these are just like some slightly boring facts about Eric Idle. But put it together yes. with like borderline, like um, uh, irritating um, speculation <laughs> that it, it sort of, it serves as a soothing balm. Yeah. You know what I mean, I, I remind people of of how unknowable and, and irritating the world is. And you are there to say, no, no, there are things that we know. Yes. You know, there are, there are facts that we can enjoy and, yeah. and bathe in, you know, like the cool water yeah. of a river. Yeah, I mean, I um, don't know how, how factual an interview is. Often interviews have to be kind of sieved uh, through yeah, the... Yeah, but, but, but at least the person being interviewed has a better idea of what they were doing than some git... Do you know what I mean? <laughs> some, to be some honest, dude, when, when you, in, a, in, a, in a bed set, um, like uh, speculating wildly. When when uh, you get to of, you know, well, I you know, well, I reckon when you get when you get to multi chin shambolic middle age like we have, I feel like the reality that you we we all absorb as we get older is that we're all just a bunch of gits. Like, that's the reality <laughs> of it. And whether that's it's true. Eric Idle talking about Splitting Airs and because he made it, wrote it, and produced it, we assume he has more, you know, knowledge and more uh, uh, context for his, you know, git-like yeah, ramblings. Yeah, you're, you're right, I suppose, to, I feel to like point you, his level of self-knowledge as Eric Idle is probably pretty low. I feel I like you, <laughs> as, a rambling, as a rambling, baldy goit in a bed set in New York, I feel like you have just as much <laughs> justification for your uh, nonsense as he does, and you shouldn't be ashamed of that, mate. Anyway, uh, in my... This is a like I, I'm trying. I'm trying. It's a security <laughs> trap. It's, it's one of your skills. It's patience <laughs> and um, uh, what's the word? Single mindedness. Again, go write a review. Jim is a wild man and cannot be contained. <laughs> uh, I can't wait to see that in print. Please, yeah, someone. John lacks the talent as a host <laughs> to keep to this wrangle, guy on point. <laughs> to wrangle wild man Jim from his bizarre <laughs> hypothesis. Uh, so, in doing that, in looking up Splitting Airs interviews, uh, I came across uh, I came across an interview um, by um, he's on Twitter as that Eton Jones fellow, uh, which sounds very uh, uh, British and um, public school, uh, if I may say that. Uh, and he said on Twitter he did an interview. Uh, and I read the interview, uh, and it's a fairly short interview, but it's a decent interview, and it's one of those where you're like, huh, Idol has spoken about Splitting Airs recently, and there's some interesting things there. There's also a lot about Catherine Zeta-Jones being nude, both from him and the director, which is sort of mildly unpleasant at this point. But uh, um, on Twitter, the Eaton Jones fellow, who clearly liked... Um, splitting airs way more than any other human being has ever liked splitting airs said mr idol graciously gave me an interview when i was writing a piece on splitting airs it's a criminally overlooked comedy which always makes me hoot um and he apparently did a series on his website called the dream cage which you can find over on the dreamcage.com called idol weekend see what he did there very clever very good i like that a lot 
uh, <laughs> Idol Weekend, uh, he did a Splitting Airs review. Um, and on the review, he got to interview Eric Idle and the director, Robert Young. So I found a tweet about this uh, back from November 24th of this year. I thought it was like November 24th, like way in the past. But no, apparently it was November 24th this year. To which Idle retweeted and said, Very kind, only I would do a nude scene with Catherine Zeta-Jones where only I was naked. To which I thought I would point out, <laughs> considering yeah. it's, it's a month later and he's probably long forgotten the, the thread... I pointed out, except that she is nude when she gets out of the pool. So it's not just him. And I said, also, didn't Cleese do a nude scene with Jamie Lee Curtis where only he got naked, like the year before, right? Claiming that Idol's tweet, where he said, only I would do a nude scene, not true. Uh, and secondly, where no, only he like, was naked. I feel like you're kicking him. <laughs> Hang on a second. Hang on a second. So I said... I then I then end the tweet, and I was being totally cheeky, but I end the tweet with, I'm also doing a piece on splitting airs, and then in brackets, and burn Hollywood burn missing pieces and too much sun. Where's my interview? <laughs> <laughs> right? That's, that is, a t like, you've told Idol all he needs to know about you, yeah. and the season, and yeah. everything. yeah. To I which, intend to peg your, your crappy movie to pieces and have fun doing it. To which he responded, and, <laughs> and, and I have to say, fair play to him for this response. Because if I don't get an interview, this yeah. will be fine. He says, interview, question mark, I may have to hunt you down. <laughs> <laughs> which you can, take, you can take that multiple ways, but here's how I took it. I took it to mean, please don't dig these films up. <laughs> <laughs> and talk about them in a public <laughs> forum. <laughs> That's how I took it to be. I took yeah. it to be, I'm not going to give you an interview, and at the same time, I'm going to send you a cease and desist. Like that's where that's where I think Idol's coming from. And to be honest, and he did it with a very funny, like cheeky. Like I think he took it in the cheeky manner. Yeah, in which, I think it's. I think it is. That's actually a funnier. That's a genuinely funny response. Yeah, that is that's good. Unless he's saying I may have to hunt you down because you're a, a you know an irritating goit, which like I am. Well, like no, I think that's the beauty of what he said. He means both things. He means both things. He yeah. means hunt this guy down because he's awful. Now let's not forget Bruce Campbell himself. Uh, cut me down, and then a year later did an interview with me. So it's not off the cuff. That's true, but also he'd forgotten you, and he was trying to sell a book. Now, and also you like what Bruce Campbell was selling, but I, I think Eric Idler can tell. It's very nice, something nice about Spurs, which is a movie that I did, and I'm reasonably proud of. And then someone else is doing a series about but He must think like... Think of your Eric Idle. It's like, no one's talked about this movie <laughs> in 20 years. And as soon as there's a global plague and people are forced to stay inside, now they can't stop talking about it. Well, two He's people. How the world go mad? Two or people. Like, but, like, look, from his perspective, that's a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, given Me, that zero people have talked about Splitting Airs since it came out. Me and someone who publicly and bravely goes by the name of Barnaby Eaton Jones. <laughs> Who liked splitting airs? Yes. Uh, oh, and in fact, he was responding to another tweet. It's, I love Twitter because you can just dig deeper and deeper into all the tweets. He was responding to another tweet, twit, uh, ah, another tweet from a Robert J. E. Simpson uh, at Avalard. Um, saying, just watch Splitting Airs. I first saw this Eric Idle comedy as a teen, and it continues to make me smile. I hadn't realised David Bowie had a part to play in its creation. See Eric's blog post on it here. Um, so apparently there was a blog post about how David Bowie had something to do with it, which I haven't read, which is terrible. Uh, so it means that there is... Oh, it's a long old blog post, though. Who can be bothered to read all of this? Uh, it's, I don't know what David Bowie has to do with it, but okay. David Bowie had something to do with splitting airs. Uh, I don't know that we can hold that against him, though. Um, to, to which uh, Barnaby Eaton-Jones responded, 
Uh, it's a criminally overlooked comedy. Always makes me who. So I, I didn't. I did not dig into this. But okay. So Barnaby Eaton Jones says a criminally overlooked comedy. Uh, Sanford Reed says very well put. It is criminally overlooked. Great to see Eric Sykes in a small role as the doorman and Stratford Johns as a butler. I would quite fancy a Blu-ray release. Eric Ardo says I'm unsure who owns it. Sanford says, Universal was the studio that released it in the US and UIP in the UK. There is such a load of old rubbish that makes it onto the Blu-ray format. Uh, I don't understand why things with built-in fan bases such as this and Nuns on the Run linger in the libraries. And I'm like, built-in fan bases? <laughs> I mean, so far we've found three of us. Uh, and I'm yeah, only... Yeah, Like, <laughs> if your fan base is so small yeah. that talking about the film attracts the bloke that made it yeah that feels like built in is a bit strong uh then eric idol who apparently was very invested in this tweet thread said it was the last film of handmade i think he's referring to nuns on the run uh but that was sold a couple of times we fought for and managed to hang on to the life of brian so we own that uh and robert says we being python no robert some other we like of course python uh think you're pretty unique as a group with regard of the ownership of your output something that the fans benefit from and something that python benefits from by repackaging it a hundred times over and getting us all to buy it over and over again um and then he says thanks for sharing uh i shared the stage with robert young at a fest some years ago but never really got uh chatting to him about his work funny the pieces i'd never really connected tonight i'm revisiting nuns on the run uh, and then sanford says good choice i had the honor of chatting with jonathan lynn last winter and he had a very warm memories of working on the film to which eric idol again responded we worked together since the pembroke smoker in february 1963 um which obviously uh is a reference to i've got to imagine like a school oh pembroke college cambridge uh a smoker is like a little like vaudeville concert right that they used to throw like a little yeah had stand up no and music and no yeah idea, mate. It was. A smoker at at, at Cambridge College was that. But it's interesting that Eric Idle was very involved with someone who loved splitting hairs. Um, But when I mentioned it, uh, gave me a a quick retort, although a retort that I will be happy with and take to my grave. I think Um, it's a great retort, mate. I think if Eric Idle can tell you to fuck off in an entertaining way... I'm very happy um, about that. The thing is, you, you... you are attempting to make hay out of the worst moments of his career. Yes. I feel like that's... Uh, that's no, I'm, just- I'm definitely the scumbag in all of this. That goes <laughs> oh, without yeah. saying. Yeah, I mean, if, if those three Splitting Airs fans listen to this podcast by mistake, yes. they are going to come after you with pitchforks, mate. No, no, I, I, I love them all. And anyone who, <clears throat> anyone who has been a fan of Python or post-Python stuff... I am. I am your brethren. I. I was. I. I was and continue. I don't think they're gonna. They're gonna hear that, mate. No. I think they're gonna. I think they are gonna want to hunt you down. That's fine. Um, my friend and and wonderful actor, uh, who you can see both on the Ratchet series, but also the Hollywood series that are currently streaming on Netflix, Herbert Russell, uh, who earlier this year I had the uh, wonderful pleasure of speaking to on my Crosstalk uh, video podcast series. Herbert responded to Eric and I, John is a delightful interviewer and quite a screen buff. You should absolutely do an interview. I was a guest on his Crosstalk podcast, and we had a great chat. So Herb, desperately trying to <laughs> dress, desperately trying to salvage. Eric's going to listen to the first five minutes of our Burn Hollywood Burn podcast and be like, yep, that's pretty much what I was expecting. Yes. But how about that? How about two, that? Two bored middle-aged blokes kicking me in the testicles over and over again for an hour. <laughs> while people in sheds chuck him a few quid on Patreon. Yeah. Listen, um, first of all, no evidence that anyone in a shed has given me anything on Patreon. (laughs) Um, So please, uh, if you're in a shed right now and you have a few cents to throw me on Patreon, that would be lovely. Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash After Movie Diner. Sponsor and donate today. For 45 minutes um, before you get to hear about the movie. That's fine. Um, they love that though. They love it, and they if do. they don't love it, I don't. I, I honestly, it's part of our quotation marks charm. I just don't care anymore, though. I, no, I've I got, know. I'm with you, mate. I'm with you. If, if, the, if the point of creativity is is you know 
all, all you hear all day long, and this is this is true of Idol, because I was watching an interview with him today where he was talking about the freedom that the BBC gave him when they first started on Python and how ever since then he's been dogged by executives and producers who would, like, deny him that freedom when it comes to creating and so on. Um, it, you know, all creatives strive for you know, the freedom to be able to do whatever they want uh, on a platform uh, that can reach an audience. So you're saying that you have reached your creative zenith. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're saying. Yes. That for us now talking about a movie that we're not talking about yeah. is, in your opinion, the pinnacle of your creative career. It's Listen, I'm very happy with it. It's not the pinnacle. The pinnacle of my creative career so far... Uh, has probably been the pleasant thing too because it's the one that people are streaming the most. Um, is that true? Yeah. Uh, true. Do you, crime, that, do, you think, do you think the film series helped? True or crime is my personal favourite, but the pleasant thing too is getting more streams. But do, do you do you think the 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 film series helped it? Yeah, I'm sure people listened to the podcast and that's was like, great. Oh, "Well, that's what we did it for, mate. That's great." Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, I'm very happy about that. Uh, so no, I just think we live in a world. <clears throat> this was my thing. I forget who I was talking to, but we definitely live in a situation where the future goes one of two ways in terms of the internet, right? Um, either uh, all the big corporations who have failed to adopt, adapt, and improve throughout this pandemic, you know, slowly fall by the wayside, and lots of little like intriguing independent trees sprout in their place, or and what is far more likely uh, is that big corporations um, just come now for the internet and they go, well, if everything has to be online, we need to own online. And they start shutting down a lot of the independence that people like me and Matt Farley and others have to produce, create and put stuff out into the world relatively cheaply in the way that we do it. Right. Um, and so, uh, if that second eventuality happens, uh, and it can happen now because of the the um, what was that thing that they passed net neutrality thing? Um, if that does happen, I want to make sure I am creating, 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 creating until they uh, tear my USB mic from my laptop and haul me out into the street. So I want to get as much stuff. Can, right? Probably only a matter of time. Exactly, and I want to get as much stuff with or out without of... the net neutrality act. Right, just people with taste and ears. <laughs> It's go enough is enough but in all seriousness i i really want to uh just um you know get out into the world all of the things um that are you know inherently make me happy and believe it or not uh talking with you about eric idol movies um is is a nostalgic happy fest for me um because i've seen all but one of these films and um they are a part of you know, my teenage life where I was like, I need to, you know, ravishly devour and own everything post Python. Uh, in fact, in my attempt to um, make myself a slightly less uh, shitty to Eric Idle, I did respond. I'm honestly a huge fan. The whole series of me doing this stemmed from me as a kid having to own every Python and post Python related stuff I could find. I had missing pieces on VHS. I tracked down the out of print Life of Brian, uh, Romance and a Double Bass, and even had the odd job. So I did try and show him I my feel like, yeah, fan I feel credentials. Like he ever listens to what we have to say about him. I'm just going to feel sad. Yeah, no, probably, uh, probably. Um, but that it is, it is the way that it is. And and to, to bring up romance and the double bass, uh, the director of romance and the double bass or love and a cello uh, also directed Splitting Airs. So that's the uh... wow. Well, I can see why. I mean, he's clearly a man with a firm grasp of comedy. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's. That's the connection there. Who is, he? Who is Robert Young? Uh, and what is he directing films? He's, <laughs> <laughs> he's a British director uh, who uh, had worked with uh, Cleese uh, back in the day. Um, and he did uh, Splitting Airs and then went on to uh, salvage Fierce Creatures when the original director kind of fell off. So he also worked with Cleese on, on Fierce Creatures. But that wasn't very good either. No. <laughs> so salvage is a bit generous well i mean salvage in the sense that he allowed cleese to do whatever cleese wanted to do uh, which was make a not very good film what is what has robert young done other than oh he did gbh with um uh well, michael, 
with Michael Palin and Robert Lindsay. Uh, laugh a minute in that one. Um, and apart from that, he did... Oh, he did uh, Hostage in 1992 with your favourite Sam Neill. Oh. UK black ops agent is sent to Argentina to find a kidnapped special ops analyst and take out the terrorists who took him. Wow, this is a cumbersome and tongue-twisty uh, uh, description on, on IMDb. It only gets 4.9 stars out of 10, and that's out of 204 votes. So, uh, yeah. Um, he Oh, he directed Blood Monkey? <laughs> that's amazing. I own Blood Monkey. I didn't know that he directed Blood Monkey. Who? What is Blood Monkey? Uh, Blood Monkey is one of those straight to sci fi channel movies with F. Murray Abraham in it about a renowned but mad professor who leads a small group of American students into the jungles of Africa to investigate a remote tribe of killer chimpanzees. Why do you own that? Well, because it's one of those, like, you know, 20 movies that nobody else wants on a box set. <laughs> that I own. I did not know that... I own more Robert Young movies than I care to admit. <laughs> no, you own more Robert Young movies than you should. <laughs> right. I own Fierce Creatures. You probably own more Robert Young movies than Robert Young. Oh, he did direct uh, Jeeves and Worcester, however. He said, um, but the, he said, I've always loved laughter. This is Robert Young. I've always loved laughter, and to make comedy is a joy, but very difficult. Edmund Keane said, as he lay with death hours away dying is easy comedy is hard to work with Cleese and Idol was always a pleasure not to forget the joy of all Michael Palin to see them manipulate a line and fine tune it was a lesson in itself but the most pleasurable comedy to do was Jeeves and Worcester Hugh Laurie and Stephen Fry worked without rancor which one could not always say about the Pythons <laughs> <laughs> yeah the problem with Jeeves and Worcester is it ought to be much better than it is because Brian Laurie is so great, but literally everybody else in those shows is a gurning monstrosity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but don't start shitting on Jeeves and Worcester. I mean, Robert <laughs> Young might actually listen to this. Uh, Eric Idle probably has far better things to no, do. No, come on. I'm just saying, everybody in Jeeves and Worcester, apart from Brian Laurie, is a gurning monstrosity. Yeah, unless Robert Young is, is dead, of course. No, he's still alive. Um, uh, still alive. Thank God for that. Uh, so he might listen uh, and might even do an interview. Who knows? Um, well, I'll, I'll track him down and see if he wants to talk for an talk hour about, about romance with a double double bass. Yeah, loving a shadow and blood. <laughs> <laughs> from, from I would you know love. I'd like, I'd like you to do an interview with him where you keep calling it love and shadow. <laughs> Romance of the double bass. You go, yeah, yeah, that's what I said. So anyway, on the sound of each other. I want to. I think it'd be amazing if it was just like uh, from from love and a cello to blood monkey, the Robert Young story. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, we we. I need to move on because I have I have all sorts of things. I have uh, emails and everything. So I got uh, I got to be quick. I got to be quick. What do you want to do? Come on, like podcast host. What do you want to do next? Next is email. So uh, to introduce this email and these messages, um, I, I need to sing this. When the battle is fought, when the war is won, when the end is near and another day is done, when you're working in pajamas and it's anything but fun, and you really want some emails because it's a mildly average podcast that you run, and nobody ever writes you, but you can always count on one. Andy Lunn, Andy Lunn, Andy Lunn. Andy Lunn is just coming through. I have to say, we have not one email from him. I do him, feel like you ought to work on an actual theme tune because... Yeah. Yeah. He liked that, though. Um, he said, he said, uh, I hope all is well. He says, hello, fellas. He addresses both of us, not just me. Oh, all right, all right. Uh, hello, enough. fellas. I'm yeah. I'm oh, now, now Jim's poked now up. Now Jim, wait, wait, wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, I hope all is well. Uh, cheers for reading out my recent ramblings. I probably should have prefaced the section about my old man with my late father, although it was amusing to hear it play out as it did. And please don't worry, there is no harm done. Lovely to hear my own personal jingle. This is a rather touching honour for which I salute you. So he's just heard it a second time and he salutes me. So enough of your negativity I, I, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to I'm saying put a little more effort into put it put a little more effort into it I'm now, with you Andy I'm glad it's promising yeah. we just use a bit of music that's I all I think Andy appreciates the slap shot manner of it <laughs> <laughs> I think if he's listened this far he's probably uh, he's probably he'd down with it wouldn't he that's what you're saying yeah. if he's listened to us he would have to appreciate <laughs> 
<laughs> sort of a, a game <laughs> laziness. <laughs> um, he said, it was refreshing to hear that I'm not alone in my dislike for Jonathan Price. I, too, agree that he is outstanding in The Two Popes, but that he is normally pretty awful in anything that he appears in. As a Bond fan, I'd like to rate Tomorrow Never Dies quite highly, as it is, in effect, a top-tier Brosnan Bond. I mean, it has Vincent I Could Shoot You in Stuttgart, Schiavelli in it, for Pete's sake. But... It is timely in that it reflects how media was taking over in the mid to late 90s. And yet, Price is absolutely fucking awful as the bad guy. I pretty much hate every scene that he's in. I groaned when he turned up in Game of Thrones and rejoiced when his time was up. He puts me off more regular Brazil viewings. He's a knob in Haunted Honeymoon and can potentially spoil the next season of The Crown. I don't mind him in Glengarry Glen Ross, but that's because he ends up whimpering at the hands of Pacino. To conclude, he is the reason that I have not yet embarked on Don Quixote, which is, I think, what we were talking about um, when we first came up with the post-Python season idea. Um, and he said, after having been intrigued to see it for years, why did that version finally get made? Why did that fucker get cast when there were plenty of other actors of his age knocking about? Anyhow, I look forward to your Eric Idle series, although having heard your discussion earlier today, I had the one foot in the grave song in my head for most of the afternoon. Thanks for that. All the best, <laughs> Lun. Hello? They say I might as well face the truth But I am just too long in the tooth I started to deteriorate And now I've passed my own sell by date Oh, I am no spring chicken, it's true I have to pop my teeth into chew And my old knees have started to knock I've just got too many miles on the clock So I'm a wrinkly And we'll get back to, I think we'll talk about, uh, we've got one more email and then we'll talk about Splitting Airs and then we'll get back to Andy's questions on Splitting Airs specifically at the end of the show. So a little bit of Andy now, a little bit of Andy later. That's how we're going to break it up. Um, But we got an email from Shane A. Bassett, uh, who regular listeners will know. He is our down under listener. He is from Australia. He listens regularly. And he is the one who is constantly asking us to do Hiding Out with John Cryer, um, which was was streaming oh, for yeah. a while it was streaming for a while and i thought oh maybe we could do it while it was streaming it's now no longer streaming so sadly we still haven't got around to it <laughs> and and bless him he keeps coming back to us all the time and keeps like listening and writing and stuff like that which is wonderful shame we really do appreciate it the fact that i keep not doing hiding out with john cryer <laughs> must be a constant source of pain and i'm very sorry but he does send us this email good day boys inspired by your decision to go down an eric idol rabbit hole i dug out my dvd copy of burn hollywood burn he actually sent me a photograph of it i've wow. not seen this dreadful movie since it was first released on vhs and nobody wanted to rent it at the video store i worked at even when it went down to weekly hire I don't know what that means. Probably a cheap, cheaper rate. Anyway, I struggled right from the opening graffiti credits and watching as it went on getting worse by the minute. It is an unfunny sleaze smorgasbord featuring horrible producers, which I forgot all about. Attached is the picture of my DVD, which I may burn. But note, Richard Greer is listed on the cover as an actor who appears, but he does not unless it was a cut scene, but the bloopers through the end credits didn't feature him either. Uh, Keep up the good work, but I refuse to watch any more Eric Idle movies unless you pick Eric the Viking, which he's not in. Uh, I mean, his his name is in the title, but he's not in the film. Um, I vaguely remember it being okay, says Shane. Um, Hope Jim releases more poetry soon, too. I love his style and recommend the prose to my mates if they want to read solid modern poetry. So there we go, a little bit of ego strokey strokey for the... Uh, go to jeawallace.com jeawallace.com and pick up a copy today either that yeah. or or click through any of the links we have multiple links on aftermoviediner.com for Jim's book we have ads and on, the, on, that, on that page at the top there's a link to a um, 
a poem I had on the American Journal of Poetry, which you can read for free. Excellent. Uh, wonderful. I, I strongly uh, endorse Jim's poetry. Uh, he ends the email with Merry Christmas from Down Under, uh, the almost COVID-free centre of the Southern Hemisphere. Cheese. Uh, cheers. Not cheese. Cheers, <laughs> Shane Adam Bassett. Yeah. And I have to say, Shane, the fact that you keep listening, as I've said again, is an absolute joy. Thank you so oh, much I would for like writing. To say, cheese, Shane. Cheese. Cheese, cheese Shane. <laughs> cheese. Um, so, how about that for lots of uh, uh, messages great, and mate. comments? And it's I, almost like. It's almost like we're not fundamentally unlistenable to idiots yeah. wasting everybody's time. So I have, I mean, how about this? It's only the second episode of the Eric Idle season. I've got an Eric yeah. Idle insults me on Twitter story, <laughs> and we have multiple uh, messages and comments. Going, it's almost <laughs> like we should stick to terrible movies. Uh, but anyway, uh, we let us talk about, finally, finally, as we enter the third hour of the podcast, uh, let us talk about... <laughs> Actually, no, before we do that, let us have a commercial break, uh, because I keep forgetting to put in a commercial break, and Spreaker does insist that I put commercials in, and now is a good kind of commercial break moment before we go to talk to the movies. So here is a commercial. Very sorry we have to have these, but it does keep the podcast ticking along. It keeps my website funded, So uh, and Spreaker insists on it, otherwise they would be charging me tons and tons of money to put this out there. So keeping the podcast free, here are a couple of uh, bad commercials. I do not endorse anything that they say, and I apologise for them having to be here. Uh, fuck uh, Geico, especially. Anyway, <laughs> oh, I really hope it's a Geico. Ad. Yeah, fuck Geico and whatever car that whatever car uh, company is trying to sell you some bullshit this season. And- Uh, We're back. Uh, Thank you so much for listening to those commercials and keeping the After Movie Diner free um, uh, as best we can. So with that, let's talk about 1993's Splitting Airs, um, which is sort of a hodgepodge combination of uh, the jerk, kind hearts and coronets, um, and uh, uh, I don't know, just a series of of very unfunny concepts that were written on a napkin. Um, See, I, I, I feel if I was, if I was being generous here and I was being generous because first of all, we, we started with burn Hollywood burn, which is about the, one of the worst, yeah. most vegetable pieces of garbage I've ever sat through. Cause it was just, it was so obviously like black hearted and cruel and yes. made by monsters. Do you yes. know what I mean? Whereas this is just, I felt like, was made by somebody who's not terribly secure um, in their own talent and doesn't know why they're funny. I think it's very instructive that um, Cleez is the only funny thing in it. Not that Cleez is exactly funny, but he is being funny with what he's given, right? In other words, whatever's happening, like, Idle knows what Cleez can make funny, if that makes sense. But I don't think Idol knows why he's funny or what he can do that's amusing. And every single, um, every single thing that happens in the movie is like the path of least resistance. You know, what I mean, it's just like so. We'll do it. Like we'll do a setup where one character has to try and kill another character, but there's no, there's no um, risks taken in that concept at all, right? No. But it's just like. No, like there's nothing like how do you have a setup where like the like the the backbone of the movie plot wise is him trying to bump off Moranis but there's not a single attempt that's even like it's not that it's like not funny it's like how would you expect it to be taken except not funny right do you know what I mean yes. like one of them are like did, did he really imagine people sitting in a cinema and a bit where he falls off a window and like goes into a pool, people would laugh. Like, I mean, being really honest with yourself, would they? And the answer is, well, no, of course not. But he doesn't try harder. And I don't, it doesn't strike me as laziness. It strikes me as, in, like I say, I think it's insecurity because I don't think he knows, he doesn't want to risk anything at all. It's like a totally risk free movie, but not in a lazy way. It, it feels kind of, I don't know. Do you, do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? What I'm saying? Yeah. No. Completely. And and it's 
so anyway, go, 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 quick. No, it does. It, it completely sm- smacks of that. But at the same time, I just like I don't know what he was. He was. I don't know what he was going for because the only thing in it, outside of a couple of one-liners and what Cleese is doing. So out, out, outside of what Cleese is doing which is really making something out of nothing. Like, Cleese really took something and was like, oh, I know how to play this to make it funny. Um, outside of that, and outside of a couple of one-liners, uh, which Idol is kind of known for, like, uh, Idol is known for sort of the pithy bon mot. Like, it doesn't necessarily right. have to be gut-wrenchingly funny, but like, you know, oh, you know, wasn't that very witty kind of thing. Um, he's sort of known for those little you know, word plays or whatever. And there's a couple of those in there. Um, but outside of that, there's just nothing in the film that you would kind of go, well, wh- like, what do you think was going to happen in terms of, of humour o- outside of really rather amateurish, uh, like, sex and knob gags, none of which land, and all of which have been done by... A million other people, much much better. Because there's, yeah. uh, they're, they're, they're are well done. Like I understand why people have some nostalgia for for the Carry On series. I understand why that bawdy end of the pier movie series is still beloved by people because there was something, um, there was something kind of bare faced about what they were doing. Like no one was hiding what they were doing. Like no one was trying to be clever about what they were doing. Uh, it was, you know, Barbara Windsor loses her bra, you know, Sid James chuckles like a sleazy milkman, and, um, you know, everyone else goes all mummy and runs into a, you know, a, a shed or something. Um, well, yeah. But I'm just... Uh, and and that, that's fine for carry-on. Um, I think any time Python has got too close to sort of that, you know... Benny Hill slash carry on obsession with uh, like tits or sex, it sort of comes off as there's only one really good s- sketch they ever did, and it's probably the the sex ed class in Meaning of Life, where they could really go all out and just be like, no, no, he's going to have sex with his wife in front of a class of boys, and the joke is all of them are bored by it. Like that's that at least had. That at least made the joke on the side of the kids, not the joke on the side of Lorca Lordy, look at all the bosoms. You know what I mean? Um, by comparison, the joke at the end of the movie where lots of topless rollerbladers rollerblade Eric um, Graham Chapman off a cliff, you know, isn't funny. Like, it's just, here's some gratuitous tits for the sake of gratuitous tits. So, um, whenever they've... And, you know, Idol often quotes the... Marriage Guidance Counselor sketch where they brought Carol Cleveland in to play a woman as, you know, he's like, when we needed real sex on screen, meaning when people needed to find the woman attractive, we brought in Carol Cleveland. Um, and and to, to, to my way of thinking, like, the, the Marriage Guidance Counselor sketch isn't so much funny as it is sort of very obvious. Um, and What's odd is this movie, Splitting Airs, it comes almost uh, uh, 30 years later. It's just shy of 30 years. It's about 25 years later of that sketch. Um, and Idol's attitudes to women, seemingly certainly in a comedy scenario, haven't changed. His thing is like, well, if they were funny women, it would be men dressed up as women, because that's inherently hilarious, Right. But as they're meant to be sexy women, let's just have them be like horrible, horrible, sexy stereotypes. And that'll be funny, right? And it's like, well, I mean, no, it's not. But that's, but that's another weird thing about it, right? Is that you got the, there's like several things going on that he obviously thought will be funny. There's, okay, there's one character that tries to kill another character over and over again. That's got juice. We could do something with that. Then there's going to be a thing where, um, he doesn't know. Um, no, he knows that she's his mum. She doesn't know, and she's a bit of a sex pot. So there'll be a continuous thing where she's trying to seduce him, and he's having to fight her off. That that'll have juice. But he, 
and I suspect it's I don't know like something to do with sketch writing I don't know but you can't the whole plot line with Hershey doesn't work because right at the beginning of the whole thing she goes oh my baby where I where where are you really and I'm like idols are in the room when she says it so oh Eric she knows that she doesn't have the baby she knows she's out there if you pop out and go by the way I've just found out I've got the rattle and the blanket so it's me then it's like oh great so no movie then so it's like okay then great but you have to do the work like but it also again got, the Hershey thing doesn't I mean outside of that and you're right with that plot point but, but the no, other no, sorry, sorry but all I'm saying was sorry, yeah, yeah. You're, th- there's no courage in the conviction of that joke even if you're trying to make that joke that his mum's trying to have sex with him and he can't but also for reasons can't tell her why that's like gross out but also I don't know maybe that's supposed to be funny but if that's the joke that's the joke you have to tell you can't set that up as a joke and then like no it never really happens like the joke is Hershey's like a sex part that's it well because if you're gonna so but the problem with that joke is is not that that joke isn't in there it's that Eric Idle doesn't know how to play it and we'll get on to Idol yeah, okay, as, yeah, Idol as a leading man but if you look at the the only other example that I can think of right off the top of my head is Back to the Future where his mum is trying to oh, have right, sex right. well not have sex with him but make out with him in the car he can't tell her I'm your son right, from the future right, 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 right. that works very well he obviously right. can't tell her but the way Michael J. Fox plays it right you know with a, with a mixture of heightened nerves and, and repulsion and you know, I don't know what I meant to do here. Kind of, uh, but, also, but that's the thing, right? Those are the what's interesting there in that moment. What's what's great about it is that there's something at stake. He he can't just go uh and then run away, right? Because right. like his whole he will literally die if he doesn't play the scene out properly. So right. his mum and me, I live up. So he can't just leave. So he has to stick it out, and that's what makes it great. Like the, in, in other words, all these things go into it right. to set up that joke. But you can't just go that's the joke and do no work or it won't it won't happen right but the but i still claim that the two two things first of all uh hershey is too outrageously a sex part like it's just yeah and also clearly younger than eric no, idol right so i'm just about to get onto that so one of the, okay, one right, of the, right. one of the things that came out uh in, in one of the idol interviews is that Hershey, because she was a bit jealous of Catherine Zeta-Jones, wouldn't refuse to age up. Like, all they could do was get her to wear, like, a a white blonde wig. Um, But she is meant to be, you know, like, in her, what, 60s? 70s? 60s? And she's clearly not. Um, An idol is clearly meant to be younger, like he's meant to maybe be in his like twenties, early thirties, and he's clearly not. Thirties, like he's been saving for, yeah. Right. So, so that's the problem. There is is that that doesn't work right off the bat. The second problem is that she's playing it too cartoonishly sex part, and Idol is playing it. I, Idol isn't playing the reality of it. I, I, Idol is playing the. Idol is playing it like a guy in a Python sketch who doesn't want the attentions of the Randy housewife. He's not yeah, yeah, playing yeah. the reality of I'm her son, and but I can't tell her that yet because stuff will happen, bad things will happen, I'll lose whatever, right? So because it's not carefully constructed, you have... And because Hershey didn't age up and because everything is miscast and that you know it doesn't work and it just leads to a series of scenes where you know our idol looks like faintly uncomfortable but not in the way that he should you know he looks uncomfortable that that he's it it comes across that you're embarrassed for barbara hershey and you should (laughs) never be embarrassed for someone acting on like once you've stepped out of that and gone oh my god i can't believe barbara hershey had to perform this you've lost the audience because i'm not thinking about the characters and, and what the dynamic of the scene is i'm thinking like Ugh. because the whole scene with barbara hershey eating her vitamins right only first of all that's like a fucking sub sub you know those movies that came out that were meant to be like scary movie or airplane or whatever but they were just called like movie movie or whatever 
You know those films that came out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they were yeah, like yeah. subpar parodies. First yeah. of all, that's like what that that joke belongs in one of them. Like her licking her vitamins off her hand like a tiger belongs in one of those films, not in this movie. But secondly, because she isn't aged up, it's just like why why is this woman being served vitamin? and it's never even commented on like you're meant to kind of go oh i guess she's yeah, his I mother like so drugs or like a refuge from the 60s i didn't even get that jack yeah so it's sort of weird and again it needed to be you know it needed to be someone like um an honor blackman right who in yeah, the yeah, that in the 80s and 90s was in a sitcom not a very good sitcom but on British TV, where she played like the the randy and still attractive older woman who everyone else was embar- everyone else was sort of cringed by because here's this woman who's far more assertive and attractive than we are, but she's older, and that was the gag. And if it was someone who was like an honor blackman or uh, you know, and they did it in the wedding crashes, Jane Seymour in the wedding crashes or whatever, like there are older actresses who could have done the part. Um, or her she could have done the part if she had you know aged up a bit but as it stands it's just fucking bizarre and doesn't work and yet it's threaded throughout the whole film so it's sort of it's sort of just a bit odd um anyway we should probably just quickly explain for people who don't know um this is a movie uh in which a baby swap leads to um idle fortuitously working for a company owned by the dukedom of um uh what's the duke of bournemouth the there's a company owned by the dukedom of bournemouth um which he's actually an heir uh he's actually the heir of he doesn't know that he's the heir of yet he's grown up with an indian family in a in a joke that idol himself admits is ripped off the jerk um so he it, because Indians are and Pakistanis are prevalent in in certain parts of London. Um, he lives with a, an Indian family and has been raised as a South Asian character, even though he's clearly white and clearly not Asian. And the joke that joke doesn't land either. It's like he completely spoils and fails to land that joke as well. Um, and then. Uh, he works for this company. The company uh, brings an American dude over from uh, New York only to find out that he thinks he's the heir to the fortune because he's grown up with uh, the mother. It was all a big misunderstanding. Idol wants what Moranis has um, and is convinced by a balmy lawyer played by John Cleese that one way around it would be to kill Moranis and then step out and say, actually, I'm the real Lord, and then the House of Lords might accept it. If he tried to do it now, um, it it wouldn't look good on British nobility, so uh, they wouldn't let it pass kind of thing. Um, so that kind of kicks into... Um, running this not very funny plot about trying to bump off Moranis, which kind of comes and goes. And then there's a running gag where every single woman in the film, for no reason whatsoever, finds Eric Idle irresistible. Even though Eric Idle dresses like uh, an accountant uh, going on a field day to uh, a church fate. Like, at no point, at no point is he even made to look like you know, young, sexy, or anything at all. Uh, in fact, he walks around in a packamac most of the time. It's sort of completely bizarre that you would have a costume designer who would look at that and look at the... Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's all by the by. Um, none of the jokes land, and it doesn't really work, and uh, it has a half assed wrap-up uh, wrap where everything seemingly works out with literally no consequence. Um, and... You know, leaves yeah, you with a kind people of people die and they're murdered, and nobody pays for it, and everybody's forgiven, and like, and it always it's sort of a weird, it's it's clearly, clearly the aim is to sail by on charm, right? Like that's what it's supposed to be. It's like it's not worry about plot, it's not worry about um, consequences, let's not worry about anybody being good or bad. Like no, like at some point it's like is Catherine Zeta Jones a gold digger? Um, a trollop, uh, uh, or like a, a like a heart of gold. Like really, she loves him, and she'll. It. Uh, she, her character is not consistent. Hershey's character is consistent. The moment she looks, at, what's also like, um, uh, like encapsulates neatly how little they care about like plot points and consequence. 
is that having gone through the whole movie not telling anybody who he is for literally no reason, because the only reason he doesn't do it is they might not believe me. That's it, right? I won't tell them because they might not believe me. And then Hershey sees a rattle. Eric Idle is not holding the rattle. Like, the baby's got the rattle. Idle is feet away. She sees the rattle and goes, oh, my God, the rattle, you're my son. We go, okay, well... Like you didn't, it didn't need to be that horribly illogical a leap. Do you know what I mean? Like it could have just been, and it's like, well, we're done with that now. The whole thing is like, well, we're done with the bit where they don't know who he is. Now we move on to the bit where they do know who he is, and we've got no interest in how we get from one state of affairs to the other state of affairs. Yeah, it's like I've got no, I don't care, and there's there's no. Well, the subplot uh, then becomes John Cleese <laughs> is bumping off uh, like members yeah, of the again, household. Like, yeah, he's like bumping off. Like, it sort of makes sense in bumping off the kid, but it makes no sense in bumping off the mother. It's like, oh, no witnesses. But she's not a witness to anything except the thing you need to prove. So why bump her off? Right, yeah. He bumps off the cook, even though the cook is the only one who, you know, could prove that Moranis is her kid and not the Duke of Bournemouth, which makes yeah, sense. I mean, none of it makes any sense. And it also makes no sense that, um, like, there's a voiceover... Even, even though Idol's character knows that Shagrind is doing this, because Shagrind has showed up earlier and, like, done well, a lot of... Right. I, was like, I, I couldn't figure out what was going on. What the... Oh, Jesus, really? That's the thing. It's like, there's no... I mean, it's obviously, a, you know, he's obviously a sketch writer, because it's like an idea of, well, this... I mean, you, you get the impression that... Maybe Idol had more confidence, or maybe it's like a, a you know he he wrote most of his stuff on his own for Python, right? He didn't really have a partner. Idol was one of the few ones who didn't have a writing partner, right? Yeah. So it feels like he either got to the point where he's deeply insecure about his own ideas, and he could do songs and stuff because they didn't know how to write songs, they didn't know how to write lyrics, so they'd like let him do that. But I can't figure out if he brought them an idea like if if Idol turns up in front of Palin and Jones and Chapman and Cleese and says, oh, I've got this idea where, um, like, one character's trying to bump off another character, and here's my ideas. He's going to, like, take a knife and try and stab him. He's got, like, all the things happen to me. They go, yeah, yeah, all right, all right. Well, what if he does this? And what if he does that? And what if the other thing? So I could see how he'd bring them a concept, and they would be the ones that would actually introduce the things that would be funny about that concept. Because there's no art about anything that happens in the movie there's no sense of timing or um possibility right that's the thing that is completely absent from the movie now i'm thinking about it it's the sense of what is possible here you know right. we've got these things this is the setup this is that we've got moranis is no slouch right uh, as a comic actor i've got john cleese her she knows what she's doing Zeta Jones, if she can, like, get over whatever weird accent she's doing, is also not a slouch when it comes to just, like, there's a natural charisma there, and she's done comedy. So there's, like, stuff to work with her, but there's no sense of what could we do with this. Like, let's just get let's just get through it. Let's get through it and try and be charming, and maybe nobody will notice that I'm not funny. And that's what the movie says to me. It's like a deeply revealing portrait of somebody who has spent the last 20 years of his life coasting by on charm hoping that nobody figures out that he's not actually funny so there's 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 two things i want to say really the the last couple of points i really have to make about any of it and 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 the two are this is so prominent features was set up just before fiscal wonder came out it was a python conglomerate movie production uh group that said well all the pythons have got to a point where they want to do like some films and some solo stuff uh, it seems like Hollywood is still remotely interested. Um, so Cleese had a fish called Wanda. I think Gilliam had, I forget which one he was putting out around about this time. Uh, it was after Baron Munchausen and I forget which one it was. But, but um, he, Monkey? No, because that was Universal. Maybe it was Universal Prominent Features. Maybe that was involved in it. I don't know. But Terry Jones had one. Uh, Cleese had fish called Wanda. Idol had this he wanted to do. Um, Palin had American Friends and, and various other ones. And they just thought, well, let's just put together prominent features. You know, it's a funny joke, but also it would give us the chance that if we want to do something as Python, we can kind of lump it under there as well and yada, yada, yada. Fishka Wonder comes out, you know, and, and here's the big difference. And the reason why I compare this one so closely to Fishka Wonder is that, you know, in Fishka Wonder, Cleese 
uh, had two major things. First of all, he's like, it's an Ealing comedy. I've hired an Ealing comedy director. I'm clearly uh, uh, homaging Ealing comedy. And yes, I've written my own uh, story and all the rest of it. But but like Ealing comedy, that's what I'm going for. I want to resurrect that, right? Second thing is that he knew full well um, he was like, I've, I've never played like a leading man. And I know that the leading man has to be in this movie, a romantic leading man. And he's like, no one's going to buy me being romantic as I am right now, you know, with someone like Jamie Lee Curtis, I have to write this and perform this and be helped in it by my leading lady to sell this idea, to, to sell this idea. You know, the original ending of A Fish Called Wanda has um, it essentially hinting at the idea that Wanda's just going to get to America or wherever they're going, South America rather, and rip Archie off and fuck off again. And he didn't like that idea. He actually wanted to end it with the idea that Wanda and him actually are together. And this is a real love story and there's a reason why they're together. And yes, there were crooks and money and Otto and all the other stuff, but like essentially... There has to be a reason why we get together. But he also realized that, like, and and Jamie Lee Curtis helped him with this, or so legend goes, that, like, instead of having a straight sex scene between the two of them, have, it's much funnier in, 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 you know, everyone's seen women get naked in in comedies. It would be much funnier to have the man get naked. And, and... Cleese was like, all right, then, I think I can make that work. You know, he he worked out, he exercised, he wrote the funny scene where he's interrupted by the the family and whatever. And he actually, like, thought about what that means, right, as a concept. And he, you know, there's a lot of thought put into a fiscal wonder, whether people like it or not. With Splitting Airs, it's all of those things but with none of the structural thought or integrity. So it's, well, fuck it, I'll just do an Ealing comedy. So Kind Hearts and Coronets has nigh on very similar plot. So, uh, uh, you know, someone trying to bump someone off so they can become part of the British aristocracy. Um, and uh, so he he takes that almost wholesale from Kind Hearts and Coronets. Um, and he has a bunch of leading ladies in it, all of whom find him attractive for no reason. There's no attempt to make that structurally integral to the plot. Uh, There's no attempt to... In fact, the only time it even comes close to it is this idea that Catherine Zeta-Jones might be carrying his baby, in which case, if he does reveal it, at least the lineage of the, the dukedom is still intact. But, like... Sorry, was I meant to like was the was the lineage of the dukedom really what we were meant to be interested in? But I, I at least I at least appreciate that. But then it also seems super weird for then her to be like, no, actually it's Moranis' baby and I just told you that because I thought you were trying to kill everyone. And then you're like, Well wait, you thought he was trying to kill people so and your plan was instead of, I don't know, go to the police or show evidence <laughs> to stop uh, him. Was to stop him, was to say, I'm carrying your baby like you know that's weird as well. That's um, presumably more motive to kill Moranis, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You're trying to kill my husband. <laughs> so what if I told you that I'm pregnant with your child? That would help, right? No, no, that would help if he was trying to kill you. It doesn't help if it, unless Moranis is pregnant with his child. It doesn't work. Yeah, but there's no. But, no, but that's what I'm saying. It's like. But there's no. Um, there's, but hang on. But there's no. And there's no attempt to cast, um, you know, either an age appropriate or even a. Um, a comedy chops appropriate but the reason why Jamie Lee Curtis and John Cleese work despite the age gap is that Jamie Lee Curtis's character is a strong willed intelligent you know feisty character she's not just a tart with a heart she she she's the mastermind and she's, she's not as old as Cleese but she's older she's like in her she, mid 30s at that point but she feels like a woman she doesn't feel yeah, like yeah, a yeah, girl yeah, yeah, yeah. or yeah, a yeah, teenager yeah. and not only that but she is the brains of the outfit she is literally manipulating everybody else she's the most intelligent person in the movie and she's not just doing it through a feminine wow she's doing it through a whole bunch of different things and so um 
you know, Cleese has thought about that character, and he also, like, let Jamie Lee Curtis come on board and, like, make suggestions and, you know, play in her character, and they rehearsed for a long time, and so on and so forth. In, in, in Splitting Airs, it's just like Eric Idle's looked at a fish called Wanda and gone, Ealing comedy, check. Lots of young naked birds who want to bone me, check. You know, me as leading man. But again, also with the leading man thing, and I think this plays into your theory of insecurity and even what Idol has said in his biography about his insecurity in general. It's the leading man thing is tricky for some comedians. I always point to people like um, uh, Dan Aykroyd and and more recently um, uh, oh Jason Sudeikis and even uh, your man from um, Arrested Development uh, 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 Bateman People who were used to playing, if you look at Aykroyd and, and, and Sudeikis are the best examples of, of a kind of Palin and Idol, uh, American version of Palin and Idol. And what I mean by that is they were very, very funny on SNL, but they used to play lots of different characters. They used to put wigs on or mustaches or beards or whatever it was, do voices and stuff like that. Like they were very gung-ho. Bill Hader's another one, very gung-ho about like putting on costumes and makeup and playing funny characters right which work in sketches but unfortunately when you want a movie career that only works to show up as the like you know comedic best friend or the cameo in the grossing grocery store or whatever it is right you can't like trying to be the romantic lead is difficult and even if you look like jason sudeikis who by all accounts is a, a, a handsome man he's still not interesting every time i see him play a leading man i'm like that's nice and all but, like, I miss him. And the same with Dan Aykroyd. Like, whenever Dan Aykroyd tried to be either a leading man or tried to be cool or tried to be nice, I'm like, it's fine, but it's not as funny as when he was on SNL and could play all these different characters. It's why the Ghostbusters works, because you're not hanging the movie on his shoulders. You're hanging it on Bill Murray's shoulders, and he has a much different vibe, right? Cleese gets away with being a leading man in Fish Kawanda because of all the reasons we've gone into and because it's a very carefully crafted movie. I don't think he would work consistently in that role, but it works in that role. Idol, who on Python and even on Rutland Weekend Television, was, like Palin, much more adept at putting on funny costumes, putting on funny voices, all that kind of stuff, and playing, you know jokey parts or weird parts or whatever well, uh, the best He's, thing Idle did in Python the best thing Idle did in Python was being like what he was in the group actually is like very slightly outside of the movie and commenting on what's happened it's like speak up you know what I mean like that right. the thing of like his his shtick in Python was often I'm the bloke commenting as a kind of like bloke on the street um, on like what's going on here then kind of a thing and it always worked really really well it was sort of a straight man act but really it was kind of like cheeky chappy turned um, you know like you know making a funny joke at the expense of characters or whatever right but it was a good shtick yeah. but you can't turn that into a into a into a leading man thing just, just like you're saying because it can't be it's like you can't like be outside your own movie you can't ironically comment right. on what your character is doing but he you and the, I mean? uh, right and the other problem is he didn't write a character like he just didn't write a character like we don't know anything about him other than he was raised by indians and makes weird references to uh like hindu dream sequences which i mean i just don't even know why it's why it's in the I don't even know why that whole it's like he watched the jerk and was like oh I'll have a bit of that but didn't think about why he wanted any of that um you know and in the jerk the joke is on Steve Martin in this it's seemingly the joke is oh there's a lot of Indians who own corner shops in London and I'm like well that first of all that's not a joke that's just a it's just a fact that's like saying there's a lot of Asians who run laundromats in New York yes and like it's not funny it just is what it is um but you know that that's what he chooses to do there was a really interesting article uh by roger ebert and i'm not a fan of ebert particularly but when he reviewed the movie he was but when he reviewed the movie he said something very astute and he was like the movie would have been much much better if you had idol as a stiff upper lip british duke who was unveiled as being a fraud by 
the like brash but happy go lucky American. There's more avenues for comedy there than having, you know, the brash, arrogant American who has everything he wants anyway, getting more of what he wants, right? And then idle what? Bumping him off, and if he succeeds, we're all meant to side with idle what? Like, essentially, the movie's asking us to side with a, a psychotic. And I don't really understand. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Because you're right, because it's so weird. You go, am I meant to not like Moranis? Because, like, they're playing him as, like, that, that thing of that English people have with Americans that you only get in English movies. And I don't think Americans realize it. I, I don't think, anyway. The Americans are these, like, like look at those look at them those lucky bastards they get to have emotions and feelings and they get they get to like be happy and not horribly repressed you know so that thing of like the fact that Moranis could like oh look he's got some roller skates on and doesn't give a shit about anything so of course he's happy the lucky bastard <laughs> do you know what I mean right. like yeah if I didn't have to care about all the you know mad things that I'm labouring oh. under then I could strap on roller skates and you know go do you know oh, what I mean another, and, another thing another thing What's one of the main threads in a fiscal wonder? The the commentary between English and Americans. And so having like two Americans show up in splitting airs, but then having all this random stuff about you know, on one hand Hershey is like, you know, British men are terrible in bed, and yet she's purring after all the British men. That again doesn't make any sense. Um but then the other joke on reverse is like, well, all Americans are what? nice people who happen to have roller skates like i don't like i don't it just <laughs> yeah there, there, yeah there's no there's no context except that rick moranis is carefree um and and happy but that's not anything except that idle like like and I, I have some sympathy here right in the okay a lot of things when you put them together and you'll you know this from songs right they're just sort of half-assed ideas about things you like, things yes. you've seen you like, things you've heard you Thank like. Thank you for whatever. noticing that my songs are half-assed ideas. But yes, no, 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 I'm just saying they always <laughs> begin that way, right? Yes. Any creative project begins with a half-assed idea of what it is that you want. And it's like, I want Jeff Lynne's take on um, War of the Worlds, right? Not Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds. I want Jeff Lynne's War of the Worlds. And that's where you start, right? And then you end up with something. But you don't just go Jeff Lynn's War of the Worlds and then go and make a cup of tea job done. Like you have to like work on it. And at the right. end, maybe it doesn't sound like that, but that's how it began. And it feels like the whole movie is a bunch of things that Idol likes. So he likes the carefree American character, um, who has and has like um, isn't weighed down by the weight of the world and history. And he likes the idea of one character killing another to get to, you know, get what he feels is his due. And he likes the idea of um, a woman who, while on the surface appears to be a gold digger, actually it turns out that she's, you know, lovely and genuine and doesn't give a shit about the things that you thought that she gives a shit about. There's all these, like, ideas in the movie that, that are basically reflections of things that he likes that he's seen somewhere else. And that, that's not, like, to say, you know, that he's, like, a magpie or whatever. It's like, that's how all, all things start. Like, no one's, like... No one stands up and is like, oh, Citizen Kane, you know what I mean? Like it's like it's like bits and pieces of things you like. And then when you it the act of putting them together and making them work and making them make sense, that work, that hard work you put in to tie all these disparate things together into something that, that makes sense and has logic and and has a point and is in the end it's like reflective of something that you want to say, that's when you get a movie. And and maybe you notice like Oh yeah, like you're saying with Fish Gwander, it's like a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but really together it makes sense as a whole because he's done the hard work to make it make sense. And this is a movie where Idol is like, well, these are the things that I like. I've got a chance to make a movie, but I, I, he doesn't do the work. And this is what I mean in, in the beginning. I don't think it's about laziness. I think he doesn't want to make a decision for fear of too obviously going for a laugh that he doesn't get. There's no, if you think back on the whole movie, there's no bits that are like, this bit's supposed to be funny, right? This is where the laugh comes. Like, like a, a moment where it's like, I'm going to wait for a laugh. And if it doesn't come, he would be crushed. Ivan would be crushed by going for a laugh that doesn't come. So the whole movie is just charm and no, and don't look back. So uh, I, I mean? I'm going to do, yeah. I'm going to do one of those duality of idol things here. Okay. So, 
I, I disagree with something that you say, but not because I think that where you're coming from is wrong, but, but that um, I, I, I think that the movie isn't filled with things that he likes. I think there is one central thing in the movie that I think is very personal to Idol. That is the interesting nugget that he should have built a story off. Instead, he sticks something that's interesting and personal to Idol in a hodgepodge of things that literally Cleese just did. Like, and I'm not saying I'm not saying you wa- w- watch the Fiscal Wonder and when I'm just going to rewrite that my own thing. I'm not. I'm not saying that. But there are way too many coincidences between what a Fiscal Wonder is and what Splitting Airs tries to be. And and I actually have to say that a lot of the reason why the movie doesn't land is because I don't think Idol cares about all of it. The thing that I think is central and interesting to this, and part of the whole duality of Idol thing, is the idea of telling the story of an orphan. Because both in his biography and both in reality and whatever, Idol was orphaned. He was, he was orphaned because his dad, believe it or not, died. His dad came back from the war and literally died, was killed, trying to get from London or Portsmouth or wherever he came home from uh, to their house. Like, he was hit and run and Jeez. was killed. Like, had survived the war but got killed back in England on his way to Isla's house. And his mum, who, like, couldn't deal with being a single mother or whatever, um, like, I think gave him up or shipped him off to an orphanage or something like that, um, only later to die. Uh, but so he he had this weird like abandonment orphan thing which he's spoken about in later years and there is something in Splitting Airs there is a nugget of that idea in Idol's character he doesn't as I think an American filmmaker would or an an American comedian would um, lean on that enough or make hay of that or, or try and like make that the central crux of the narrative he doesn't have the the conviction and i think that's where the insecurity comes in to like play the more emotional things like one of the the reason what Cleese realized in a fiscal wonder is in order for me to be taken seriously i need to play some of the emotion you need to see archie get sad about stuff or you need to see archie get angry about stuff or you need to see archie be a human amongst all this madcap zaniness right we'll leave the zaniness to otto otto can be the zany one and yeah cleese will have some zany moments because you've got the python uh uh fan base coming to watch it but ultimately cleese had an agenda when it came to what he wanted to do idol doesn't necessarily have the strength of that conviction and i think splitting as falters more because of it and i think that there i so what i'm trying to say is I think he took the idea of being an orphan and wanting to discuss that idea and wanting to talk about that and dumped it into a bunch of stuff he didn't yeah, really care about. You have about. to say that the, 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 the insecurity thing comes in there too, right? Because there's a feeling of, he, as you say, I don't think he like consciously is ripping off Fiscal Wonder. It's more like, well, I'm making a movie and I'm deeply insecure about that. So what do I do to like ground this story? What do I do to keep the story moving and keep people entertained? Well, what did Cleese do? And he probably's like, well, Cleese like took it in. Come, well, I can do that. I can do that. Like, that's not. I'm not ripping him off by being inspired by an alien comedy. That's fine. I'm not ripping off by getting American actors in. If you want to make a movie, you got to get American actors in. So that that works too. Like, there's, uh, you know, what I mean, it's like, yeah. How no, do I totally. make my movie? And by falling back on what he thinks are just like small little, like, well, what did Cleese do? It's not a rip off. It's like, oh, I'm just taking that little part of it. It's got nothing to do with my movie. That's got all these things in it. But he doesn't realize that. When you when you stand back from everything that he's put together, it's too heavily built on those things, and actually that ends up being like the foundation of your movie. And the foundation of the movie, as you point out, is not the story of an orphan. It's that it's an obviously ripped off alien comedy with some like Americans as comic relief, which is basically right. what. Clean- but like. like for example, if you were interested in doing comedy about the British aristocracy there would be more, like, obvious commentary on there. There isn't. If you're interested in doing comedy about, like, you know, London, Wall Street types, you know, traders or whatever, and the finance and blah, 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 there'd be more commentary on that. There isn't. If you were interested in discussing the American-British divide, there would be more commentary on that. There isn't. If you were, like, all the things that are in the movie 
I don't think he does care about. Like, I would like to see an idol movie that he's written about stuff that he does care about. But I think that I think that the problem is where Cleese went through therapy and therefore was a little bit more interested in actually exploring the idea of a character and a and a concept and a and a and an emotional arc for for a person. I think Idol was more uh, interested in just well, how do I get a movie out where I'm I'm in it kind of thing, um, and less yeah, interested and also, in sort also, of. To be fair, like if you go through a traumatic experience, like clearly he went through, and your response to that is I'm going to be a comedian, right? Especially a comedian of like I'm a little I'm a little bit of an outsider. I'm not part of the group. I'm just gonna I'm going to comment on it, and by not caring about the things that they care about, by being separate from that right by being the you know um blessed other big noses right um by not being on the same wavelength as them by being outside of it i get to be funny because i get to like by not caring and breaking up their vibe i get to be funny and if he's an outsider and was able to make hay out of that comedy um then that's how he chooses to like deal with those things right he chooses to deal with them by like just you know just keep them laughing just that's it. So, like, keep be charming. Keep them laughing. Don't think too much about it, and you'll be all right. You know, what I mean, you'll be biased for being pulled in the sides because people think you're witty, which is fine. That's, and they do. And fair play to old Eric. Right, but it's but difficult to craft a leading to, character around that. Yeah, but that, that, that's no way to construct a, like, as you say, a character that needs even even like a, in a Jean Claude Van Damme movie um, of the early 2000s like his character has an arc do you know what I mean like right. they even understand that you have to learn but what is what has I to learn that um killing people to become a duke is bad like what's the, do you know what I mean like what's the lesson here he's learned nothing he doesn't learn to appreciate his roots like that's not what because he ends up with the with the big house it's not like oh what I've learned is that being raised by a family that loves you is more important than like the house you grow up in so he doesn't learn that he doesn't learn that um, murder is bad because he sees literally no consequences for trying to bump off Moranis. Moranis just forgives him because he's a bit of a laugh and he, you know, he just likes hanging around with people. Um, and he doesn't even learn that, um, uh, that like having sex with your best friend's girl is bad because you fancy her and you think, like he's sort of petty and jealous and he doesn't even learn that those things are bad. He gets rewarded with the house at the end. And there's that thing with Sadie Frost, where he's like, and I sold my story, and then I married my secretary so she wouldn't sell her story. Go, well, A, what story is she selling? And B, the ending of your movie is you're going to get married to somebody on the basis of, like, self-preservation and, like, of what, too? Of, like, what do you even care? What are you? What name are you protecting here? Why are you, like, sinking into an apparently loveless marriage on the basis of protecting a name that you don't possess and you don't care about? And what, like, is that an ending anyway? Like, yeah, no, none, not, of it, like, none, none of it makes a lick of sense. Want, but you also get nothing. It, yeah. It's so weird when you yeah. think about no, it. Yeah, no, when you start to break down Eric Idle's character, he's a real fuck. Like, like he's a psychotic he's a psychotic <laughs> London trader wanker who has clearly like sexually harassed his secretary and then who ends up mar- tries to kill his best friend right of, completely abandons his loving family and then shacks up with the secretary so he, she doesn't sell her story of sexual harassment and nightmares he's a fuck <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, it's um, very, it's very, very strange. It's very strange, and I just, I just, I, I just, it's not at any point, funny. Or I, I, I think or it's I, just the only thing, the only thing I can find to say about it that I did find myself charmed by was I did at least think, unlike Burn Hollywood Burn, it was good natured. It was made to be charming and breezy, and don't think too much about it, and people falling over and like having little bon mots is funny and like the urination gag gets me too right because there's a bit when Hershey and Idler are in the shower right and the German bloke comes in and has a piss and the joke presumably is he it's a he's having a piss for a long time but that's the joke but they totally undercut the joke by cutting away from him having a piss to like Moran is talking about something and then cutting back 
and then it doesn't even go on for that long and then he stops he goes, we're going to get an Austin Powers bit here where he keeps pissing but they don't even do that so so what's the joke that a German bloke came in and took a piss and left that's it you know what I mean there's no yeah. like it's what I mean it's an absence of possibilities there like everything on a movie when the cameras are on and there's people gathered even if you've only got half a script like that's the thing about Die Hard right that I was I was reading afterwards so we talked about it because I watched Die Hard on Christmas Eve that apparently like Die Hard wasn't really finished as a script and they were kind of winging it as they went on you go well there you go like look at what they came up with like it was it wasn't even supposed to be it was supposed to be terrorists it was supposed to be like a very straight edged action film and it became like a classic because they changed it and they sort of made it up on the fly and they kind of ad-libbed a few things and it became something because like, you know, there were possibilities there. And there's oh, Wow, I didn't even I didn't even there. realize this. Eric Idle is actually five years older than Barbara Hershey, who plays his mother, and Idle is ten years older than Rick Moranis, even though they're meant to be about the same age. Well they're well, meant, to be, they're meant to be exactly people. the same age. It doesn't surprise me that it's very, it's very odd. The whole film is very odd. And it is, and the thing is, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, I am confident that it is absolute, what's that? Um, oh no, that's, there's a story in a, in a book I read about a guy, um, it's a true story, he was like a music journalist and he was in a band. And, um, they had like their big shot, right? This band. And they were doing okay. And they had the big shot and they had a gig. And um, there was like some A&R people in the crowd. And it didn't go very well, right? And it didn't go very well because they weren't really that great. There wasn't like a great spark there. You know, they didn't really get on as a band. There wasn't a lot of a vibe. So the guy goes backstage and he says to the bloke, is that as good as it gets? And in a moment of deep personal clarity, the guy replies, yes that is probably as good as it gets, right? And from that point on, he quits being a musician and just leaves because he suddenly comes to realise that he doesn't have it. And the thing about this movie is, this is the best movie that Eric Idle could possibly have made. You know what I mean? Like, his personality and who he is and what he considers valuable, especially in terms of his time and his effort, it was never going to be any better than splitting airs. He is clearly given pretty much carte blanche. I don't care what he says. No executive was breathing down his neck demanding that he make a funnier movie because because that did not happen, right? Like, there's no effort there. So no one was breathing down his neck. They were like, whatever magic it is that Python has, let's just let our idol make it and hopefully it'll make us a fortune. And it's, you know, it's, it's nothing. So that's what I mean about this is as good as it gets for idol. This is what he thinks is a good movie. I, I mean, I guess so. I just, I just think that it's, you know, it, it shows very clearly that you can't have, um, you know, you you can't success, you can't have a character in the center of a movie, a comedy or not, that doesn't have some kind of, you know, emotional investment in the in the story. <laughs> Uh, it just doesn't. It just doesn't work. Um, no. Even if you think of something completely madcap and ridiculous, like airplane, you know the two leads in that, you know, want to be together, want to be in love, want to survive the plane. Like there's still a story. You know what I mean? Like even though yeah, it's, yeah, it's fake. Yeah, yeah. It's very, it's very basic because you can't expect people. You can't expect people to laugh if they don't think the characters are at least at some point being real that what is happening is real even in airplane it's like yes it's ridiculous but he needs to land the plane you know what i mean um and so it's sort of borderline exciting when you don't try and come up with a story you end up people it's very difficult for people to care so this this is a quote from the, the, this uh, i will leave us with this quote from an eric idol interview from november okay I was told a true story by a friend about him being left in a telephone booth in Sloan Square as a baby. The piquancy and Oscar Wilde quality immediately appealed to me. Also, one of my favourite films is Kind Hearts and Coronets, a man who discovers he is a long way down the bloodline to inherit an English title and starts to bump off all above him to claim the title. The Indian Family is an obvious lift from Steve Martin's The Jerk, which killed me. I wrote the movie in six weeks on the island of Mystique in David Bowie's house he kindly lent to me. So that really tells you all you need to know. He went <laughs> off to Mystique, 
uh, you know, sloughed around David Bowie's house and and borrowed a bunch of stuff from other people, which he, he admits himself. But what, but what I like, and I, I think is is very, again, revealing about Eric Idle, is that the story of a baby being left in a telephone booth, like, appeals to him. For its, like, Wildean, whatever, its Oscar Wilde-like charm, right? Yeah. Um, so instead of, like, making the story echo that charm, that in the telling of the story he will get to the Oscar Wilde, he, like, makes people dress like Oscar Wilde and drink champagne and talk about the baby in the phone. Go, That's, it's not because people dress and act like Oscar Wilde and discuss the story in the phone booth. That's not what makes it Oscar Wilde, Eric. Right. right? It's the story, you fucking idiot. Yeah. Like, it's all, I, I, all I know is I like it because it sort of reminds me of an Oscar Wilde story. So I'll just get characters to talk about it like they're Oscar Wilde. No. Yeah. <laughs> that's not how it goes. It's like, that's how you tell stories. But it's so odd that a, that a guy that clearly loves telling stories can't tell a fucking story. Right? Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I agree. And it's just, um, there are three threads uh, that go through Idol's uh, career, career that he created. So the stuff that he's written. Okay. Uh, they are Rutland. He can't get enough of Rutland. He wants to put Rutland in everything, from Rutland Weekend Television to the Ruttles to the Ruttle Isles, which we heard about uh, on the previous uh, episode. Um, the second one is uh, obviously Python, like, but predominantly like uh, uh, Holy Grail. Uh, but but Python in general, obviously, he's like I say, he's he's kept Python alive way more than the the others did. Maybe Terry Jones did a bit, but he certainly get py- kept Python alive and being a Python and talking about Python uh, a lot more than others did. And then the third theme is. Um, the British aristocracy and jokes around that, and I'll tell you why. Uh, what first of all he did splitting as, um, but he has also talked about working on um, other scripts about th- this subject. There was a script that he was going to do that was basically a broad parody of uh, Downton Abbey when that started, that no one would give him money for. <laughs> I, w- I wonder why, um, and. Then he ended up doing a musical uh, with Billy Connolly and Eddie Izzard and Russell Brand and a bunch of other people called What About Dick, which is sort of, I think, probably based on that script, kind of a a witty uh, knockabout, you know, bedroom farce set in the British aristocracy. So he has about three things that he's really carried throughout his career. Um, And I can certainly say, having seen it, because it's on Netflix... What about Dick is at least funnier than Splitting Us. <laughs> I'm not going to say how much funnier, but it is funnier <laughs> than Splitting Us. I, I just think it's... it's Splitting Us is a weird one for me. I mean, my my quick capsule review is that I watched it a ton growing up, and I probably definitely watched it in the idea of, well, I've, I've seen Python, I've seen A Fish Called Wonder, I've seen the other post-Python films. This is just what post-Python films are, so it's just nice to watch... Like Eric Idle. Yeah, I can see how if you're if you're a kid, it's kind of breeziness would be easy to digest. Right, because if you like, it's not till you're an adult. Like if you look at, for example, if you look at this versus something like, I mean, Kind Heart and Coronets is probably the best example. But like something like a Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, right, which is like two people trying to like play off each other and outdo each other and whatever. If you're a 13-year-old and you watch Dirty Rotten Scoundrels and Splitting Airs, you probably kind of put them on the same kind of level because you kind of go, well, you know, humour is funny knockabout people, one American and one British, kind of doing stuff to each other. That's kind of funny, right? Not to say that I was an idiot at 13, but you know you know what I'm saying, right? You watch a movie yeah, yeah, with certain eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you get older, you are intrinsically aware of just the layers upon layers upon layers of structure and farce and intelligence that there is in something like a dirty run scoundrels and not only that but you become more abundantly aware of just how amazing both actors are in it when you watch splitting airs as you get older and and with other eyes you start to see just the absolute lack of substance that there is in it and that while there is still a nostalgic glow for watching eric idle and rick moranis knock about the screen together for a bit it it certainly does not carry its you know 
uh, one hour, 26 minutes. Um, but, but anyway, that was just the other point I wanted to make. And uh, um, let us go, before we wrap this up, to Andy Lund's comments. All right. But thank you. I think we've talked longer about splitting airs um than uh was probably worth it but i think we got <laughs> i think we got to some real truths and i think that's I important I think, we did too. I think i think if very idle is listening he's probably weeping right now at the truth that we've reflected back. <laughs> <laughs> you cut me to the core jim and john yeah. um all right andy says and this is funny too I often get splitting airs mixed up with parting shots, although I don't think I've actually had the pleasure of either. If you've seen them both, are they at all similar, or am I just mixing them up because they were both panned? And is one of them so bad that it makes the other look like a masterpiece? Are you aware of parting shots, Jim? Is that... Is that a winner joint? Parting shots is a Michael Winner film <laughs> that stars Chris Rea. That mountain of charisma. Oh, I do remember that. That's right. right. It, 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 oh my god! If ever there was a movie that was made up in like a restaurant in Surrey, <laughs> this was definitely made up in a restaurant in Surrey. Chris Rea stars as man, and all of Michael Winner's dinner guests. Joanna Lumley and John Cleese and other people show up for what I'm sure are hilarious cameos. But as I've never seen it, I can't confirm or deny that. I almost... Chris Rea. Yeah. Jesus. I think, also, interestingly, I think Parting Shots... I'm not even kidding. I think Parting Shots represents the line I wouldn't cross in post-Python watching. Because Clee shows up in it as a cameo, and I've seen the trailer. But I so wish that on the bottom of the cover of the part <laughs> shot it was, represents the line I wouldn't cross. That's such a great review. Meaning, I think that by the time Parting Shots came out, I was old enough to know that I didn't have to watch every single oh, post I think it's a shame thing. because you would have seen it otherwise yeah I would have seen it otherwise but I oh, think it was the line I didn't only known if he'd only rushed out if he had that that dinner with Chris Rea yeah well I will now go back and watch it but no Andy I have not seen it but I am now intrigued deeply oh, I want to see, I want to see parting to shots see whether so parting can shots we do is... a Michael Winner season can we do a Michael Winner season sure we did parting shots and Bullseye I've never seen Bullseye no I've done Bullseye already during my Roger Moore episode oh okay and dude, but Bullseye does not warrant. I've watched it recently, and it does not warrant uh, rediscovery at all. It's <laughs> okay. awful. I mean, I would be willing to discuss it. Sure, I'd be willing to discuss it, but not a whole episode. I would be willing to like, yeah, we'd reference it. Reference it, yeah, sure. I, I, I do. I kind of want to see Parting Shots now. I can't believe somebody made a film with Chris Rea as a hitman. That's presumably the story, right? I, I think so. I remember. Um, Wow. But I do want to answer Andy Lund's question as to is one so bad that it makes the other look like a masterpiece? Um, I'm intrigued by answering that question. So I will watch Parting Shots, Andy, and get back to you. Uh, the next question here, or the next comment he has is, on an entirely separate subject, do you think that the one foot in the grave tortoise was shunned by friends and family for taking the gig of appearing in the title sequence as Eric's god-awful theme tune plays out? It's possible. I guess. I mean, the tortoise is probably still alive, right? They live a long time, so he's still carrying the shame around <laughs> now. Is it? Wasn't Eric like in the pilot episode of that show? Uh, no, I think he's in the final episode of that show. No, I think he's in the first episode. I seem to remember, and this ages me horribly, that in the promos for like, no, you want to watch this? It's funny because Eric Idle's in it. I think he was in the first episode. I don't think he's in the first episode. I think he's in the last episode, but I'm going to look it up right now well, and get you right. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. Um, I have been known to be wrong on many, many, many occasions. Uh, season two, episode eight he appears in uh in the episode the man in the long black coat uh i don't know where season eight falls there were 44 episodes so it's certainly not the last episode so i was wrong but he's not in the first episode he's definitely not in the first okay. all right okay i Never don't mind. think i can remember that wrong not to worry 
Yeah, he's not in the first episode. He is, uh, I will look at season two. He might be in the last episode of season two. He is. He's in the last episode of season two. Okay, so that's the promo I saw then, I guess. Uh, yeah. So, um, also, uh, I did some digging and fell down an Eric Idle rabbit hole, uh, just as, as Andy Lunn brought up theme tunes. Um, and he was in a uh, an American sitcom, like like he he actually tried to be the lead in his own American Ooh. sitcom uh, called Nearly Departed, which doesn't make any sense because in it he plays a ghost. So I guess the joke is like he's departed, but not really. But he is actually departed because he is actually dead. So yeah, but he's not like gone to heaven or whatever. I know. I, I think that. I think that. I think that stands. I mean. So now I want to see that. <laughs> so you can. There's an episode, episode ten. Uh, it, it only lasted a season. Uh, I believe it lasted. What's weird is it says on um, IMDb that it lasted six episodes, but on YouTube it calls it episode ten. Um, but anyway, uh, it is. Um, he sings the theme tune. The theme tune to Nearly Departed is a full, like, three-minute Eric Idle song. Everyone lately is making me crazy Now that we've joined the deceased There'll be no resting in peace Near, nearly departed Stumbling cockeyed The moment that rocks light Came tumbling down on all heads Departed. It's hard to ignore when a family of four is running amok in our home. They're constantly near us, they can't see or hear us, nobody can. Except the old man, just pushing up daisies, we halfway to Hades and halfway to heaven. But the, the premise is Grant and Claire Pritchard are a deceased couple who still inhabit their home and make trouble for the Dooleys, the new owners. But Grandpa is the only one who can hear and see the ghosts. Hilarity ensues. Um, How do they make trouble if no one can hear or see them? <laughs> you have to watch it and find out. But look up Nearly Departed on YouTube. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, I can see why you fall down the rabbit hole, to be fair. Oh, but it's so... There's so much <laughs> rich weirdness to find. <laughs> because, because someone on YouTube... Someone somewhere, I don't know who, but God Some bless... Hero. God Some bless humanity. Um, and I'm not even religious, but bless humanity. Someone somewhere has the Nearly Departed intro on VHS from, you know, 1989... And and at some point in the last ten years was like, well, YouTube's a thing. Someone might want this, and <laughs> uploaded it to YouTube. I mean, someone somewhere is doing the Lord's work. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's all I'm saying. You know that someone someone stumbled across it in their VHS collection, and instead of I don't know setting fire to it or taping <laughs> over it with tits, decided to uh, put it up on YouTube. And you can't really fault them for that because. In the year 2020, at the end of the year, as the as the 2020 waned, uh, uh, a British middle-aged misanthrope found it online and was like, oh, that's a thing, and then moved on with his life. <laughs> richer. Richer. A little bit richer. A little bit richer. A little, always a little bit richer is how Idol would do. Idol was like, oh, that's a cue for a song. Always a little bit richer. What's going on with the theme tune as well? Just playing ads because he like keeps dropping it three times. Initially, it was like it's a song they're dancing to in a sixties disco. Like, All yeah. right, I get that. And then it's like a weird, like eighties thing about my baby's. Someone's hit my what? baby. Work. But it's like sort of a joke the way that it's sung because it's kind of like a fifties thing, but also not really. It's so weird. It's so, not funny. It's so so what's funny. really weird about it is that he wrote a song, someone came and took my baby away. What can I say? Like right like a like a song. He he wrote that song, right? Yeah, and right. 
the director probably went, all right, Eric, we can put it over the title sequence, which would be one thing. All right, put it over the title sequence. But what's weird is right before the title sequence in the prologue, um, like you said, there's a sequence where they're dancing in the nightclub and they play the song over that sequence, but not in an attempt to make it sound like it's in the nightclub, but just like over the top of the sequence. Then there's like another brief sequence. Then the song comes in over the theme tune, over the over the credits. You're like, wait, it, are we now? Like, are we listening to the song that was playing in the nightclub? Oh wait, is that Eric Idle singing? Oh, it is. Okay, so what? So they just didn't have another song for the nightclub and just use the same. Song. All right. Then you notice that all the orchestral and even the Indian music cues throughout the movie, throughout the whole movie are orchestral or Indian instrument versions of that baby song throughout the whole film. Yeah. And then over the credit sequence, I don't know if it's the same song, like the same version or whether it's a whole other version, but it then plays again as if as if the <laughs> as if it hadn't bore itself into your brain and made you want to But it's like it's not even as if like if you asked Eric Idler right now, would this even break the top hundred songs that you wrote? you know since you started writing since 1989 whenever this movie came out there's no way it would even you know I mean? it's like not good it's not funny it's not catchy it's not good and yet <laughs> it's so not good he said it wasn't good so, there you go that's the song this is it yeah you do that the disco and the theme tune and can we get to one of the credits no use that again for the credits what about like an orchestral score yeah just base it off that like it is it's where I begin to suspect laziness, and my insecurity thing slightly comes under attack from the fact that that's clearly laziness, that he couldn't be bothered to write anything else. So here's, here's my thing, and, and, and this again, I mean, no one's listening at this point, it's two hours in, but um, <laughs> here's my thing. The reason why I feel the need to dig in and dissect Idol is I fear that while one might want to have been John Cleese growing up, I fear that I'm probably idle. In the sense that when I write stuff, not so much my music, to be fair, because I've, de- I've definitely put a lot more thought and effort into that of late. But certainly the sketches that I, I put on occasionally on, on um, the front of the diner, not that I don't like them and not that I'm not intending them to be funny, but they I write them for me. I don't care if anyone else gets them. I don't really care if they're all that that good because I just think to myself, well, you're getting extra content, so like... <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I definitely have an approach which is more idle than it is Cleese. I'm not sitting down and trying to structure, you know, the greatest three minutes anyone's ever written, right? Yeah. And and the few times that I've had ideas about movies, it's very much like, oh, this would be a great idea for a movie, and then I could do this, and then I could do that, and then I could do that, and then a movie ends. And it does <laughs> and and as much as I understand the concept of what a movie should have in it, I'm not that interested <laughs> interested right. outside of how does it make me feel. So I feel like <laughs> I'm more idle. So this whole series, and that's why I'm putting this right at the end of this episode because no one's listening. But this whole series of me digging deep into into idols uh, uh creativity is really looking at the dark shallow heart of my own emptiness creatively 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 I almost want to leave that pause there so you can end the episode at that point. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was such a dark way of ending it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. I, I, I think we all of us want to be pleased but fear we're idle, you know? And he stands there as a warning <laughs> against anyone who would choose to make or do anything <laughs> that it is easy to think that charm and past success uh, equate to contentment because... I don't. I don't think he is content. I don't think splitting airs. It's like everything about the movie screams. Is this enough? Is this enough? I hope this is enough. You know. And 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 I'm. I'm. This is. I'm going to end the episode uh, because just like um, uh, just like parting shots was the film that. 
uh, was the line I would not cross. <laughs> Splitting Airs is the film that made Eric Idle leave the United Kingdom. And I'm not oh. even kidding. This is a quote from an actual interview Eric Idle gave very recently. When being asked by a, uh, let's, let's say, overzealous uh, interviewer, as a great comedy film, it seems underappreciated. Do you think people were expecting a Python-esque film and weren't prepared for the clever and black-humoured farce that it was? Eric Idle's response, uh, uh, I think, cuts deep because it shows the wounds that still haven't healed many years later and is laced with delicious uh, um, uh, desperation and insecurity. The British press behaved like the shits they are. Alexander Walker and Baz Bamingoy attacked me at Cannes because the French had chosen it for the festival. I couldn't believe it and determined to leave the country, which I did. I had raised about twelve million from Hollywood to spend in the UK on the film business. Catherine, like he, he did. He <laughs> saved the British film industry with this movie. Um, <laughs> Catherine Zeta-Jones was so attacked by the press, she cancelled her trip to the Cannes Festival, and I had to walk down the stairs alone. One of the loneliest and saddest experiences of my life. Coming from a guy whose father died (laughs) on his way home to him. I have never regretted leaving the UK and would never open anything first there. They eat their young. They would have killed Spamalot, for example, so I opened it on Broadway. They also attacked my play, Past the Butler, directed by Jonathan Lynn, which was actually quite funny. If, if he does say so, so. <laughs> if, 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 imagine like the reviews of the play, right? It's, a, <laughs> it's a, actually quite funny. Yeah. The author. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, the author thinks it's quite funny. Maybe I'll go and see it. T- talking again about Splitting Airs, he says, I was amazed years later to discover that people actually like the movie and it was George Harrison's favourite. No, uh, it wasn't. <laughs> I'm saying that right now. I'm saying that George Harrison definitely preferred Life of Brian over Splitting Airs. Definitely. <laughs> Flat out, definitely. Because I think had George Harrison really liked Splitting Airs, he may have paid for it instead of getting uh 12 yeah, exactly minutes right. so he probably said eric it's the best movie in which you were the lead opposite Catherine zeta jones i've ever, ever seen. seen yeah i either that or, or he said it after he was quite ill and thought i'll just say a nice thing to a friend before i die um oh that's bleak that's <laughs> done <laughs> <laughs> Could be true. Yeah. Could be uh, uh, anyway, it, it was George Harrison's favorite. He said, "It's like Rutland TV. It went from being what I thought was a flop to a cult, and then a classic." Well, okay. Let's just say right now, Splitting Airs is neither a cult, not by anyone's <laughs> standard, and is most assuredly not a classic. Um, Mr. Barnaby Eaton Jones, and that's seriously what he calls himself on his website, so I'm going to take it to be his name, uh, on the Dreamcage website. And no offence to Barnaby Eaton Jones, it's a wonderful Python-esque name. Congratulations on that one. I'm sure uh, Eton and Cambridge were wonderful places to have gone to. Um, He thinks it's a wonderful movie, and that's fine. He's allowed to. That's that's marvellous. Eric Idle seems to think it's now a cult classic. It's not. It's not. It's not in any way at all. Uh, he doesn't. He, he thinks it's a cult classic, but doesn't even know who owns it or how it could be put out on Blu-ray. <laughs> uh, and apparently, the, the the reason why it failed is that the British press are shits. Um, actually, what's interesting is when I, because I thought, oh great, let me go read some reviews attacking Idol. I looked up all the reviews I could find, and the most the most attacking review I could find just simply says, considering it's Idol and Rick Moranis, you would expect it to be funnier. And that's it. I didn't find any reviews attacking it. You know what I mean? Most people just kind of go, huh, with all the pedigree involved in the movie, why is it not funnier? That's really what most people feel about it. Yeah, and that's, that's actually what I remember of it too. I remember there being like, quite a lot of pride about Fish Called Wanda, right? That at the time, there hadn't been a, like a big British film in a long time. Um, and the idea that we'd made a film that was funny and popular was like a bit weird. And I think that people were hoping for something similar. And they, it, people didn't, I don't remember it being attacked. It was just like, it's not that funny. And then the people ignored it. And I don't think Catherine Zeta-Jones was attacked in the press and so wouldn't appear at Cannes. I think she was offered the chance to launch her career 
and took one look at that movie and went, if I don't run away from this as fast as humanly possible, I will not have a career. So, no, Eric, I will not be appearing next to you on the red carpet because also we're not the couple in the movie either. That's the other thing. It's like, who's who's the... like? He doesn't even have a leading lady. Is it like? Is it Hershey? Is it Zeta Jones? Is it Sadie Frost? Like, Rick Moranis and Catherine Zeta Jones are never anything other than happy together. So, what the fuck? So there we go. Uh, that's about as deep as I'm going to dig on yeah, fair enough. That's split, about it. That's splitting about it. airs. But I have to say, what are we doing next time? What are we doing next? I have time? to say, congratulations to the Dreamcage.com for getting that interview because it is. It's a very eye-opening interview because with the director and the star years and years later you know doing an interview for the Dreamcage website what have they got to lose so they are fairly open and frank about it and that always leads to a more interesting answer uh, and a more interesting delve into Idol's psyche um, where it's seemingly either the British press or Hollywood producers. He can't win on either side of the Atlantic. On one side, he's got producers hampering him and telling him that, you know, it can't be funny enough. And uh, on the other side, he's got the press. So, you know, I don't know. Better stay home and uh, count his spam a lot cash, I Better guess. And stay in David Bowie's house. And, and stay uh, in David, David Bowie's house. Um, so what are we doing next? Well, we're going chronologically backwards. Um, and we've done Burn Hollywood Burn. Uh, we've just done splitting airs. Next week, it's missing pieces. All right, well, I shall look forward to that, mate. Here's a here's a question, and I'm going to. Do you think that in missing pieces, Eric Idle somehow sings the theme tune? I'm just going to put it out there. <laughs> I think it's entirely possible. Mate, yeah. <laughs> and the only reason I go back to saying that I am Idle is that if I had been in a bunch of things, I too would want to sing the theme tune. <laughs> Yeah, I know you would. I know you would. However, you would take a listen and go, don't. Get someone else to sing the theme tune. And I would listen to you. Thanks, man. Yeah, even though deep down I'd really want to sing the theme tune. So I don't, I, I don't, again, and I deep leave. Down, I wouldn't want you to. I leave this episode with the duality of Idol. I kind of love him. I kind of like him. And I kind of get where he's coming from. But at the same time, put more effort in, Eric. Yeah, I, I'm with you there. I'm with you there, mate. Like, he wrote the song Fuck Christmas. That was mildly funny. Fuck Christmas. Okay, I get it. Fuck Christmas. Hardy, hardy, ha. Then the next song he did was Fuck Selfies. At that point, you're like, I, I don't know how much turning, you know, old old man rage and confusion <laughs> into songs <laughs> beginning with the word fuck. I don't know what legs that has, Idol. I really don't know. Like, maybe... <laughs> However... How, it, <laughs> Whatever legs it has, you can bet Idol's going to find out. <laughs> It'll run them until they're stumps. But I, lo- sure. I, I love the idea. He sung it recently at a, a book signing when he was going around for his autobiography. And that must be lovely to be in the audience thinking, oh, wow, you know, I get to see my, my hero from Python, Eric Idle. He gets to tell me some stories about his autobiography. And, and he starts the thing off with, like, don't fucking come near me or ask me for a picture because I fucking hate it and fuck you all. And I, it, you must just be like, huh. I, would, I mean, if I was Eric Idle at this point, I'd want people asking me for a selfie because who, who's asking him for a selfie? You know what I mean? Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, the duality of Idol. I love him. I, I can't stand him. I love him. I can't stand him. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a rich... And it's the same with me. I, I love me. I hate me. Uh, it's a rich scene that we, we dance along. Jim, yeah, we're definitely opening up some... Uh, this has some been... This, into our psyches here, mate. This has been a pleasure. I've loved every single mad minute of it. Uh, next week, we'll talk about missing pieces. I can't imagine what we're going to dig up around that. Um, God knows, mate. God knows. <laughs> We're going to be weeping by the end of it on the floor, remembering our birth. <laughs> See, what's interesting is I seemingly I I remember enjoying missing pieces. Like I remember watching missing pieces several times and enjoying it. So oh, I think right. well, that, so I think I'm hope, going to be weirdly embarrassed by that. <laughs> hope springs eternal, mate. You never know. You never know. I was just born lucky. Yes, I guess it's true. But now my lucky luckiness has all turned into blue. Time with my baby, I was also fine. But 
You came right along And knocked me for a song You took everything that should be mine, 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 mine Someone came and stole my happiness away Ha, 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 ha Now somehow that someone's gonna have to pay Lost my baby when he stepped in He took my life and everything He stole my baby, now I'm so blue Tell me what to do <laughs> Someone came and stole my baby away <laughs> Someone came and stole my happiness today He came along, he did me wrong He's gonna have to pay some way He's gonna have to pay some day Yes, he's gonna have to pay